it's uh, it's uh, on you. Can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> so, um, I've only actually learned about the uh, Herzberger, I think a couple of years ago unfortunately, but I'm still glad I did. Um, and it's a shame that actually students from home are not uh, here yet. Maybe they'll come hopefully later because uh, I think I think um, they could really use to look at, at his architecture. Sort of. Alexandra, do, do you think you could uh, come closer to the microphone? I don't hear you very well. Yeah, yeah, I'll try. Can you hear me better? Well, please say something. <laughs> Can you hear me better? I don't, it's about the same anyway. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my laptop is very old. Um, so yeah, I was saying that it's a shame the students are not here, but um, hopefully they'll come across them at some point as well. Um, so um, yeah, I just gather a couple of photos of uh, him when he was younger. Uh, he has some lovely text, um, um, some sort of uh, memoirs of um, his experience as a as a child through Amsterdam and uh, sort of um, kind of stories of how he got attracted to architecture in the first place, even without realizing it. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Alexandra, I don't want to bother you, but there is that little palm, that little, that could you, I want to make a perfect uh, recording. So yeah. <laughs> just uh, marginalize it a little bit. Thank you. Um, so he has these stories where uh, um, his father was a doctor and he would go um, uh, from house to house uh, for his patients and he would have to wait for him outside or go up and down the street and um, he sort of um, uh, emerged himself in this, you know, in the context of um, of the neighborhood that he was living. Um, you know, being attracted by certain details of the buildings and so on. Um, and and I think it's very beautiful the way he describes it. And uh, um, I think it's also what helped him later on. Um, um, Within architecture and within the sort of architecture he is, uh, he he did. Um, here, I think, is uh, when he graduated. He opened his uh, studio right after in in the attic where he was living with his wife. Uh, and this is how he looks right now. And right on to the projects. Um, his first project is the student housing in 58. Um, he was laughing that they won with this uh, sort of boring volume, but um, then he thought it better and uh, added this sort of um, uh, street at the fourth level, which would serve um, the accommodation for the married couples and kind of um, create this other street level um, uh, for, them, for them separately. Uh, and, and I think, I think what I, his, his architecture is um, definitely, I think, um, best known for this attention he, he gives to uh, the way people use his face and um, the fact that he, he just creates this sort of minimal framework where people would interact with the space and make it their own. Um, and uh, this can definitely be seen from uh, early on his projects. And I think personally what I like about it is that um, 
he gives his architecture time. Like he's not looking to sort of create a final product and more like a, a frame for 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 a um, process to take place. And um, he he also mentions that he's always um, going back to his projects to to see how they evolve, to see to learn more from them. Uh, um within this project of of um, people taking over the the structure and he always, always emphasizes this um this um social aspects of his building um he always militates for an architecture um that's aiming to bring people closer together And yeah, his his spaces, I think, they, they encourage this sort of interaction on multiple levels. And also those those so so called um, basic devices that he that he names them um, that don't necessarily have um, just a prescribed usage, but you can you can always go around them and try to imagine how you the poss the possibilities that it could be used for. Um, this is a um, an extension for this laundry factory or workshop. Uh, fortunately, it was demolished. Um, but then again, you can you can see this uh, structuralist idea of. Um, creating a, a framework that would then um, allow for, for the functions inside to change or to extend or so on. Um, this is, I believe, yeah, this is a retirement home, I think. Um, but again, what a retire retirement home, I wish, uh, I wish we'd pay this much attention to our elderly nowadays. Um, I mean, they had everything from uh, um, cafes to this gaming place to, I even saw a video, they had like a hairdresser uh, inside this whole uh, complex. And it's nice to see, at least an architect nowadays, especially, it would be nice to see them paying so much attention to the um, disregarded. Um, because people, old people, I think they are disregarded. Um, uh, and often they feel isolated in our society. And um, especially as we evolve and we become sort of more and more individual, um, and I think elderly are people who really like to socialize too. And they even have, I find they have this sort of, um, they're not afraid to do so. Like we would feel uncomfortable to just go to a stranger and start talking to them. Whereas they have no, no problem with it. They're, they're quite happy to, to learn about you and about your day and so on. Which is nice because they know how to listen. Um, how to give uh, an advice, which not um, often we we don't find time to do. So Ben, yeah, he has those spaces there. I see some children here. Um, Spaces that allow, uh, you know, interaction between generations and so on. And also the fact that he allows um, people to appropriate these spaces with, you know, their own possessions, their own um, uh, 
uh, objects um, that they care about, their own flowers, their own curtains, their own uh, furniture, um, and allows them to, to make the spaces their own. He has this uh, <laughs> sort of uh, famous Dora horse um, that gives gives also um, uh, um, what's the word security to people, but also the the opportunity to to just come to the door and have a talk with your neighbor or somebody passing by. Um, this is here, the first food he designed, the Montessori school. He also attended a Montessori school, um, which probably uh, had a role in, in his formation as a quite a critical person and the way he understands the world around him. And I like that also that he trusts people that um, they're, he trusts people that they're creating enough to, to take ownership over the, this, their own space and to, to, to use it as they please uh, and as they imagine to. And he says that um, uh, architect's best tools are his eyes and his ears um, or should be his eyes and his ears because it's the most important thing is to to observe and to listen um, which he clearly does in this at least in his uh, earlier projects that he claims that he always come back comes back to 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 really observe how how people interact with them and uh, use them and how, how they change with time, the function, the usage ch changes with time. So here the, he had this sort of um, sunken ground um, which you could fill up with those chairs that you could use for a small gathering um, or often children would just empty it and play around. Um, or this sort of platform which you think would have no uh, no usage in, in such a space, but the children will always find a way to, they're always inventive and find a way to, to use the space around them. And by simple means. Uh, and it's true, I remember I was, um, I spent most of my childhood in the countryside and um, uh, my only playground was the street um, and the trees of the neighbors and so on, or I would steal my uh, grandma's uh, kitchenware and uh, cook with mud and sand or fruits or whatever. Um, and children, children, I don't think they need much. I think they just need uh, just an opportunity for for their imagination to to go wild and. Um, Really, I think the, they, they, they look at life by the, by the story they create by themselves, or something like that. Um, and it's quite, it's quite um, rich and beautiful to see they, the way they uh, interact with the world around them. This is um, another project, uh, sort of a experimental housing he did, um, uh, which again looked at this um, theme of appropriation of space um, and giving people the freedom of, um, first of all, sort of creating their own space within the house, um, as in the house did not have a special room for the bedroom or a special room for the kitchen and so on. 
uh, there was only the structure and um, the rest was given the freedom to choose was given to the to the user um, and the inside of finishes and furniture and so on and they also had the possibility to extend it in time as well or change um, so for example he left spaces like this open balconies and those um, cover spaces and canopies which people in time um, uh, transformed, they recovered them and added a new room. Um, the flat rooftops as well, some of them uh, created greenhouses on top of them. So you can see here, um, they all chose to either let, leave those spaces open, use them as a garage, or create new rooms. And again, children um, getting uh, very creative with their own space. It's like what we saw in uh, Florian and Diana's uh, example in the park with the benches. Well, children resolved to use it as a sort of uh, play device. Uh, the greenhouse. Again, different um, objects added to the roof, the sort of uh, flower pots. And different um, arrangements inside the, inside the houses. Again, these the um, the fronts of the houses. Initially, they were they were empty, just paved, and people in time uh, started planting trees and making small gardens and so on. Um, this is an office building. Um, which again is in the same sort of guideline of bringing people together, uh, even in a working environment, building, uh, bringing the work with the leisure, with um, social, uh, the sort of social life together in, in just one space. Um, and it's, it's sort of as a sort of um, city inside. It's, um, He, he thought of those uh, covered streets of a sort of um, um, galleries, those kind of covered galleries you see in France. Uh, it's another thing, he's quite, he's quite critical about his work and quite transparent in, in terms of the, um, the references he's, he's taking and he's actually, he's actually encouraging um, people to to gather as much information, as much um, sort of special spatial references they can get and, and just use them. Um, in one of the um, lectures he was um, quoting Picasso saying that you should, you should copy um, everything but your stuff. And by the way, I, I um, Again, I wish the students were here. <laughs> I would really recommend uh, their uh, his lectures. Um, they're really motivating, um, and it's quite inspiring. And also, he he looks at life with humor, I think, and I think that's that's very important. Um, we don't really do that nowadays anymore. We're always stressed and running for for something. And, um we take ourselves too serious kind of i mean i do for sure and i don't consider myself as creative as he is so 
as you can see, there there's spaces for um, everyone, for every occasion, for um, all generations. Um, and it's a it's a working space. It's a it's an office building. Um, but I've never seen something like this, and it seems to work quite well. And he allowed um, the employees again to to bring their own furniture to. Uh, populate the space with, with their own objects and, and even uh, artworks. They had artworks made by the employees. This is the music center. Again, he introduces the sort of inter internal street, bringing um, the city inside the building and it's about also this this procession towards the building and through the building this meeting those meeting grounds The Apollo schools. <coughs> he said he didn't he didn't care much about the um, sort of the exterior. Uh, the external envelope of the building. Like he was very much interested in with the space inside and um, how to provide those basic necessities for people and then let them take over the space. Again, it's quite nice to see how children uh, find different functions to some very elementary um, um, spaces and objects. You know, he says that architecture should not uh, um, impress it should accommodate the ordinary and i think that's that's um, indeed what his architecture is doing although you wouldn't call this column quite ordinary i guess but uh, it's quite a nice detail and children do use it It's a housing complex in Berlin. Um, one of his um, few projects outside in the Netherlands. I couldn't find much about this one, but uh, um, again, as you can see, you can. It's just a framework for, for people to come in and um, give it their own personality. <laughs> I was listening to a talk about this one. I remember he um, people were saying, why did you put those columns so inconveniently in the middle of the, of the space? And he was saying that he did his best to do that. Uh, um, in a sort of way to, to provoke people to, to think about the space around them and how they interact with it. This one, I feel like this one is almost uh, intentionally built for this sort of greenery to take over. It's, it's kind of like a a greenhouse in a way. 
this is a dormitory in Japan for um, factories uh, employees. Um, yeah, I guess here intervenes the sort of uh, spatial efficiency that is quite common in Japan. You know, sort of predominantly rural area and um, we wanted to, to break this, um, the, um, the volume. Um, sort of keep down the scale and also make the um, this walkway in such a way that um, it would have it would be connected to the to the exterior and have views on both sides it also has a sort of um, um, that kind of lyric feeling about it that um, I think you'd find in most of um, um, Asian architecture as well. But inside is quite a um, sort of austere and it's, it's quite different. I find his, his uh, later works um, in a way not as convincing as, as the earlier ones where he would militate for it. There was this way of people taking over the place and uh, changing it and changing the functions and the way the project evolves. And college. Again, I think his um, um, sort of educational spaces, they quite, in a way, they get quite repetitive, but um, uh, but it works. I mean, those spaces are really incredible. I wish I, wish I had a school like this, definitely. Um, so it's again about this, um, bringing this street inside the building and um, um, creating this, this social space, those, all those sort of devices um, meant to, to let people interact with each other visually. Um, Come on, honey. Another Montessori school. Uh. Yeah, he does say he doesn't um, care care much about the, the exterior and the sort of aspect, and but well, I don't know about that, but. Uh, But I do, I do admire the way, the, what he does in uh, the interior um, with the space. And sort of, um, you know, using the space efficiency, what do you do with the space uh, beneath the stair? And, you know, those are just events. Um, this is a... I think another sort of experimental house. Um, it's a sort of floating house, which again, um, the project talks about um, um, the sort of advantage that a floating house would have um, if you being able to, to place it wherever you'd like um, and orient it um, however you would like depending on sunlight and so on. This 
the culture house. Again, as I said, same ideas, it's quite repetitive, but again, it, it works. Um, I guess it depends on the on the scale as well uh, in the program of the building. But definitely in the, in the school environment, I think it works best. I mean, this almost looks insane. I can't, I can't, I could not even imagine. I would like to go see a space like this. It's yeah, so real sometimes. Another university. This one was a um, sort of extension. It was uh, um, this quite fragmented existing building. Um, and he said he, he did what people would not expect of him and uh, tried to, to, to frame uh, the building because um, the existing one was quite, quite uh, the language was quite similar to, to what he would do. Um, he came up with um, a structure that would frame the existing and sort of enclose it and keep it together. I don't know, I feel here it becomes kind of, you know, trying to be a bit dramatic, um, kind of what, what we're used to today, sort of in photos. Um, the scale also seems a bit different. Another school in Rome. No, they are, now they're not even children anymore in the school, in the photos. Or maybe I just didn't find the, the right photos. But again, he has those quite, um, you know, nice elements of um, sort of oppor opportunities um, for you to, to think about using the space around you and the furniture and um, even the structure, why not? And I think this is it. Yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. You, you do like children. Uh, the many pictures of your presentation have children in them. And uh, yeah, they, uh, they bring some life to almost anything. Even even very rigid uh, structures. So, if anyone wants to say something, if you want to have a discussion, if not, I'll start the second uh, presentation on uh, our adventurous Japanese uh, uh, half artist. I, I, I would like to say something, if I may. Please. So, yeah, thank you very much for all these uh, images and photos and explanation. I enjoyed it very much. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting how you pointed out how it changed also in scale over uh, over the years in, in later works. Um, I have not been to um, Herzberg's uh, buildings, but whenever I see the photos, I always wonder because it seems always relatively small and very relatively tight, at least the, the, the earlier projects. And, um, yeah, and also the materiality, of course, it's like a very exposed um, concrete 
stones and so on and so forth. But I always wonder if uh, not a bit of more surface treatment uh, would have been better. Um, because in, in a way, um, even though it leaves it open to the people, it also appears a little bit um, and cheap. And, and with this cheapness of the materiality, I have at least the feeling that it's also more prone to uh, vandalism in a way. But I, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, um, just now be, be, be negative. And then, but because I have seen uh, a couple of projects like this in, in Rotterdam, and I um, very much appreciate that. And of course, if you talk a little bit about uh, Herzberger, then maybe we should also have, once it's his birthday, uh, talk about Piet Blom. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, his projects. Um, but they are all quite interesting because uh, he has like the, the cubus houses in, in Rotterdam. I don't find them so fantastic, but I mean, they're a spectacle and everybody goes there. But uh, there's the Kaspa housing in, in Hengelo, and this is very interesting because he puts these houses on stilts, and there is the, those sort of this uh, connection in a way uh, with uh, yeah, Constant Ewan House with the new Babylon, so the, the raising of, of the ground, the, the Homo Ludens. And I think this is in, in all these. Uh, more uh, anthropophic, uh, human-centric uh, architecture from the structuralist. This is sort of inherent in the way this this place space and the place uh, and people, rather than uh, you know the, this notion of time and space, the place and location. So uh, I find this very interesting. So maybe we should do once a, a only a round on structuralist and their ideas behind. Um, and, and what they were standing for in, in this criti criticism for, for the rationalism. But yeah, thank you very much. Hi, this is Daliana speaking. Uh, Alexandra, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I mean, I feel embarrassed, you know, because uh, Hermann Hertzberger is the founder of our school, uh, Berlacher Institute, where Florian and I went. Uh, well, the thing is, we we're not engaged with, with him, although he's still alive and today he's 88, by the way. Uh, so happy birthday, uh, Hermann Hertzberger. But um, we were so busy with our studios and everything else and I'm embarrassed that I did not know so much about him and I didn't engage with him when, when we were there. Uh, so yeah, it's really good to know. And uh, uh, I think every school you know, has to at least give some basic education to the students about the founder, you know, like about, how's, uh, about Walter uh, Gropius, then this one, the Berlaco should actually always um, have a welcome package that includes, you know, get to know Hermann Hertzberger. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I agree with, uh, with, with what Daliana said that, uh, you know, uh, it's important to, to uh, in a way, to start with the beginning. That is, you know, the founder should be known. And unfortunately, <laughs> many times the founder is ignored. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, in time, uh, some justice is, is, is made in some form or another. Anyway. So, if you want, if, if no one else wants to say something, we'll uh, celebrate the second uh, architect today, uh, <laughs> who was actually not an architect, but built very different buildings than uh, Herzberger, and a uh, very interesting man. I, I knew nothing about, uh, although I did see once some pictures published uh, somewhere of his buildings, but I, I, I didn't know he, he made the, those buildings. Uh, so, if you allow me to, uh, Alexandra, uh, do I need uh, to get back the right to use the, the, sc the screen or not from you? I guess uh, we are co-sharing, so I, I guess it will be fine. Let me just, uh, just a second. Uh, okay, go here. Okay. And now uh, I open my my pre my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, do you see Shusaku uh, Arakawa? Yes. You do. Okay. So we we start from the beginning. So he died in 2010. Uh, he, he actually expected to never die, and uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is an incredible uh, thing in a way, both about him and his wife and partner and. Uh, <clears throat> 
he actually worked together with uh, with her <coughs> and you'll see her so uh, her very soon uh, they were very interesting people they they actually promoted the idea of an architecture that fights off death and uh, <laughs> she even amusingly said that um, aging should be outlawed she actually believed in uh, in, um, in in the power of architecture to uh, to defeat uh, the passage of time but unfortunately this is not easily uh, done and uh, she, they both died i think he died at 74 and uh, she died at 73 here he is young he first studied uh, um, he studied uh, uh, mathematics and then he studied in the medical school and at 26, uh, as he declared, he arrived in New York City with $14 in his pocket and the telephone number of Marcel Duchamp, uh, the provocative French artist who at that time was in, in the United States. And they became friends. And uh, it looks like uh, Arakawa was able to, uh, in time, to add something to those $14. Since later on they built uh, of all places in East Hampton, New York, which is an immensely expensive uh, place to to build in uh, their own house uh, with their own money, about two million dollars. So I guess uh, the the starving artist uh, found a way to defeat certain inconveniences of life. So here he is at a certain age. I don't know his age here, but it's okay. Um, then he's older here, looking for his wife and partner, and you'll see her now. Uh, they made a very interesting pair, really, and uh, when you see their buildings and uh, contemplate a little bit that their ideas, you understand that they were dreamers. Uh, but they were able to build uh, uh, upon or on their dreams. Uh, so um, <clears throat> they met in, uh, in New York City and uh, for 40 years they worked together. So, you know, he's considered a Japanese artist and architect, but, you know, the conception of who is an architect in Japan is different than in other countries. <clears throat> I don't know who gave them the right uh, of signature as uh, in some countries uh, the laws require, but, uh, you know, Certain countries are not inhibited and inhibited in this respect. I understood that the Scandinavian countries, in the Scandinavian countries, you don't even have to study architecture. As long as you have commissions and you can honor them, it's fine. Incredible. So anyway, he worked with Madeleine Jeans and for more than, than four decades, for more than 40 years. And as you can see, he was born on July 6, just like Herzberger. So he spoke of himself as an eternal outsider. I like that very much. I kind of identify with that. And you know, he's my friend just for that. An abstractionist of the distant future. A funny way to put it, an abstract abstractionist of the distant future. <clears throat> as I said, he first studied mathematics and medicine at the University of Tokyo and also art at the Musashino Art University. He was a member of Tokyo's Neo-Dadaism organizers, a precursor of, uh, to the Neo-Dada movement. Arakawa's uh, early works were first displayed in the infamous Yomiuri Independent Exhibition, a watershed event for post-war Japanese avant-garde art. I love this, and I, I actually think that uh, the Dada still has uh, some potential for architecture. It sounds improbable, I am aware of it, but I also know that one of the four founders of the Dada movement was actually an architect, Marcel Yanko. And he built uh, in Bucharest about 20 buildings, not in the Dada way, but uh, um, yes, I, I do think that uh, Dada architecture could be very interesting because it would have a critical side even an acid side, it would be a, a, a malevolent kind of architecture. Uh, and I don't know if you can imagine something like this. I, I mean, of course, there is a lot of architecture that is malevolent, but not intentionally. But to make it sarcastically malevolent, 
the way the Dada artists promoted uh, the non-art movement would be interesting. Um, anyway, so he arrived in New York City with 1961 with $14 in his park pocket. We already know that and the telephone number for Marcel Duchamp, whom he from from the airport and with whom he eventually formed a close friendship. Beautiful. He started using diagrams within his paintings as philosophical propositions. Now, some very famous philosophers uh, commented on his work. Jean-François Lyotard said of Arakawa's work that it makes us think with, through the eyes. And Gadamer, another great name in, in, in philosophy, described it as transforming the usual constancies of orientation into a strange, enticing game a game of continually thinking out. I'm not very sure what he meant, but quoting for Paul Celan, the Romanian poet, one of the greatest poets of the second half of the 20th century. In fact, he is placed in the vicinity of Goethe, Rilke and Hölderlin, which is uh, almost uh, uh, hard to believe. Gadamer also wrote of the work, there are songs to sing beyond the human. Interesting uh, statement. So there are songs to, to sing beyond the human. And maybe this is, I mean, not maybe, this would be very relevant in, in, in an post-Anthropocene uh, uh, era. There are songs to sing beyond the human. Charles Bernstein and Susan B. observe Arakawa deals with a visual field as discourse model systems that constitute the world rather than being constituted by it. a complicated way to, to say maybe that, you know, it was the artist Arakawa that, uh, uh, you know, was constructing the world and was not allowing the world to construct him. Arthur Danto found Arakawa to be the most philosophical of contemporary artists. For his part, Arakawa declared, painting is only an exercise never more than that. But we will see his buildings and their buildings. They founded, a, I don't know if it could be called a company. There is a foundation called Reversible Destiny that he founded with, uh, together with his partner and wife, Madeleine Jeans. And it's a very interesting, uh, um, <laughs> almost, uh, uh, almost uh, surreally interesting. I mean, they really, they really thought that uh, uh, through architecture and through art, they can defeat uh, death. And actually it is so, of course, because uh, uh, art at its best is able to transgress the limits imposed on life by death, but not literally. They expected, they expected to live forever. They even built a house, a house where you would not age and you would see it. Uh, but they did age and they died. So um, architecture against death. For Arakawa and Jeans, the ideal form of a house was one that kept residents in a perpetually tentative relationship with their surroundings. What do you think they meant? Perpetually tentative relationship. In other words, it was more about becoming than being. It was about the dialectics of life and they were not afraid to, to even make so-called uncomfortable, uh, uh, you know, uh, environments. So the more our houses, our homes challenge us architecturally, the more likely we are to stay young, grappling with their complexities and in the case of Arakawa and Jeans flats and houses, their sheer oddity, even perversity. So let's think a little bit about this. Friedrich Nietzsche said, live dangerously. And I agree with him, it's hard to do it. He himself maybe didn't do it. I mean, he did do it because he dedicated his life totally to his writing and his thinking and, uh, you know, he suffered maybe because of it in his later years. But what Nietzsche said and what Arakawa seems to take connects with, with the, 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 the thoughts on, on, on architecture that, for example, Peter Eisenman had and some other people uh, from his circle, that the uh, best architecture is the one, is not the one that is comfortable, 
is not the, the one that that uh, uh, you know uh, is uh, is uh, as as uh, Alexandra would say accommodating you. Quite the opposite is one which could even irritate you. And strangely, perhaps Arakawa and Jean thought that this could be a source of remaining young, staying young. That if the house challenges you, you have a chance to yes to remain young. And maybe it's not so odd actually, because uh, there is even that saying, uh, "What what doesn't kill you saves you." That is, if it of course if, if it doesn't kill you. Uh, so their most extreme design, the Biosleeve House. Uh, from 2008 in East Hampton, Long Island, in New York, took eight years to build and cost the couple two millions of their own money. My God, two, two millions of their own money. I wonder how many millions they had. Anyway, I, it happens that I live for two years in East Hampton by accident, totally by accident, so I know what East Hampton is. It's, uh, I was working for an experimental school there and the lady who hired me was uh, one of the richest ladies uh, on, 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 on earth. Uh, her, her husband uh, was the CEO of Hollywood for 10 years, Mr. Ross, and uh, he died of cancer. And so she built a house and I was one of the architects that she employed. But East Hampton is a very, very expensive uh, place. You know, Richard Meyer has buildings there and, uh, you know, the other New York fires and uh, all kinds of celebrities go there. For example, the neighbors of this lady that I worked for, right across the street was Steven Spielberg and Kelvin Klein. They were uh, her neighbors across the street. Anyway, um, so uh, we go now to, to look at this strange house, maybe very strange inside, outside, I don't know. <laughs> They had this naive uh, belief that uh, it is a lifespan extending villa. It actually didn't work on them, for them. But as uh, some kind of alchemical uh, betting, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, the alchemists try to find, uh, you know, to, to transform uh, uh, lead into gold. But uh, <clears throat> Carl Jung saw that the real alchemist we're searching for the inner goal, for the psychological world, not for the so-called, uh, you know, the, the vulgar one. Well, here I think is some kind of a distorted uh, alchemy in their case. They truly believe this is a lifespan expanding villa. And if you lived in it, you defeat uh, death. Well, it didn't happen. And strangely now that villa where they lived is for sale and nobody wants it. You know, I, I just read, nobody wants to buy it. Although it was meant to be, uh, offer you the, the youth, uh, to be a, a youth fountain. The, some described it the most uncomfortable house in the world. This is almost a compliment. It's not easy to make the most uncomfortable house in the world because there are many uncomfortable houses in the world, but they made it intentionally so. I like this, I never, I, ne I mean, I know about this location, but I, I, this expression belongs to them, that this locative architecture. So apparently they believe that this locative architecture could actually uh, enhance life. And it's possible that some truth is there. So <laughs> it was also described the house where you live forever. Well, they didn't live forever. This is the house. From the outside is mm, not so special really, besides the, you know, the colors. But once you go inside, you realize that uh, this is an interesting house. I mean, just look at it. There are deals there, you know, it's, uh, and you are not very sure about the scale. The people look very small. Uh, you know, you'd expect them to be taller than, than they appear to be. Uh, there are there are dislocative uh, strategies at work here. I mean, if you look at the stair and the you know the risers, I mean you know and look at the people. It seems they are you know 30 inches uh, uh, tall at least. Uh, so there are 
surreal elements in this house. I mean, who put something like this in their house? But if you are to know to live forever, sure, why not? <laughs> I, I I am amused by this house, and actually, well, I shouldn't tell you all the details of my personal life, but I, I have a tendency to transform wherever I live in something kind of similar, but not by design, by, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it, it just happens. For example, uh, uh, the, the, the apartment that my parents uh, left me, now the door, the entrance door doesn't open to an angle bigger than uh, 30 degrees because it touches exactly something like this, some kind of a hill. In fact, I, I told the students here that uh, there is a hill at the entrance of, of the apartment uh, that my parents uh, left me. Uh, and I, I cannot easily, if I gain some weight, I, I cannot get in because the door doesn't open because of this uh, hill that you see here too. Maybe one day I'll show you that, but that will be the last time you show up at the, uh, my, uh, one of my presentations. Because here it is by design, not because of some uh, maddening accumulations. This is the house. Uh, very colorful indeed, and color is vital. Uh, this was known also by uh, the Stil and uh, other art movements. Uh, there is something, something a little bit Dada, because the Dada were uh, essentially they were against homes. And they, they, they uh, well, they were even against art. But uh, uh, although Tristan Zara, one of the four founders, uh, built for himself quite a big house in Paris, uh, the house author was Adolf Loss, uh, which was not at all a Dada building, a Dada, yeah, a Dada building or a house. Anyway, this is uh, this is so. This is a, a model of of this uh, this uh, so-called most uncomfortable. I'm sure there are other uncomfortable houses. In fact, much more uncomfortable because many people who who do not uh, have uh, uh, the means to live more uh, comfortably they they uh, suffer in impossible spaces all over the world. So I wouldn't say that this is the most uncomfortable. No, it is not. But, you know, this is the sensationalist way to uh, talk about it, to publicize it, to make it public. So uh, you can read a few things here about how this, how the, how this house was built. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah may, may, maybe you realize that this was essentially a painter and his wife was also a painter and a writer and then she became an architect too. Um, but the idea is interesting in a way too. And you can see there are students in architecture perhaps uh, climbing the dunes and, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I do believe that joy could prolong your life. And there must, there might have been here some kind of strange combination between joy and suffering, if indeed the house was or is very uncomfortable. Um, But it is, I don't know if it is the most uncomfortable, but it is a unique house, no doubt. And this idea to bring the labyrinth in the house also, and not just on the floor, but also on the ceiling, you know, it uh, creates an additional, uh, additional dislocative, uh, dislocative uh, perceptions or experiences. Otherwise, the ceiling is, is rather tall. <laughs> Can you believe having something like this in your house? Uh, well, I, they, they, this is a rendering. They didn't build it quite like this, but that's what they wanted, I guess. Um, well, one thing we, we can say for sure, it is an ex experimental house, they built it for themselves, and uh, 
you know, experiments are welcome. Children who won't die are a carbon. We, Madeline Jeans, uh, I don't know. So this was a message to transhumans. They were dreamers, of course, uh, uh, utopians. But I, I think that there was and there is a place for such people in our world. Hello, Mr. Arakawa. Uh, <laughs> and his wife. Um, they built that building behind him and we are going to see it in, in, in Japan. It was built just like that. <laughs> so the, the couple that wanted to defeat death, can you believe it? Okay, now we arrive at the apartment building in Mitaka, Tokyo, which is uh, as colorful uh, as uh, the roundhouse, if not more so. Inside, of course, the spaces are smaller, but the color is used abundantly. And look how it looks outside, looks like outside. Uh, you know, it is a little bit burlesque, but, um, you know, it's, it's 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 not uh, yet in a in a in a really bad taste. It's it's, it's joyous. I actually think, and uh, soon there will be the birthday of Michael Graves, and Michael Graves, one of the New York Five, also was tempted uh, in the later years of his life to to build kind of in this uh, ludic uh, way, but uh, with a with an understanding of what uh, the, the ludic means, uh, perhaps a little bit too explicit, uh, uh, pointing a little bit to, towards some kind of infantilism. Uh, I think Arakawa and his wife are more convincing than Michael Graves. And I think that is because they, are, they, they didn't suffer the, uh, you know, the, the the, the architectural education that uh, Graves suffered from, probably. It's much easier to be ludic when you do not have the training of an architect. If you do have the training of an architect, you must struggle with a tension, with a conflict even, uh, between what you studied, what you learned, and, and what your ludic impulses tell you. In other words, it's much easier to be innocent in a convincing way if you didn't study architecture. Otherwise, you, you just mimic innocence like Michael Graves did, and I think with terrible results. That's why I, I, I even removed him, and I, 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 I debated with myself if I'm doing the right thing. I removed him from the list with the celebrations. Maybe I'll put him back, but uh, I struggled with him because he was a, an architect with some talent, who ruined that talent because of a certain infantilism he was trying to uh, mimic as innocence or some innocence uh, or the other way around. <laughs> anyway, it is an interesting apartment building, if we can call it so. Uh, but, but you can still see already a certain naivete for which they paid in a way, you know. Uh, but I do think that we need, we need even naivete uh, because uh, when, when you have passion and you have idealism, uh, almost inevitably at times you are also naive and even ridiculous. I remember a, a beautiful poem by uh, Fernando Pessoa who was contemplating his love letters he wrote and he said, you know, any writer of love letter is ridiculous because to write love letters is ridiculous. But then he turned against himself and said, actually, the one who is truly ridiculous is the one who never wrote them, one who never writes them. And I agree with him. But yes, there is this risk of when, when you are, uh, you know, to an extent innocent and uh, exuberant, uh, you risk to be, uh, you know, even ridiculous. 
but again colors are saving uh, saving the story i i think uh, colors still have a great potential in architecture and i'm i'm afraid uh, uh, many schools of architecture many architects do not use it are afraid of colors not everybody of course but many architects uh, are not at easy uh, are not at ease with 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 uh, with the chromatic aspects of architecture and it's a loss, really. Uh, maybe a room that, uh, you know, a room, yeah, is a room here. This cylindrical container is orange. Well, if it was white, I don't know. I mean, many of the famous architects of today, they create the same tiring white architecture. You know, maybe interesting in terms of uh, volumes and space, but is it enough? I don't think it's the worst, uh, you know, housing complex in the world. No, uh, and it's unique. It is unique. It is a little bit uh, on the burlesque side of architecture, but uh, that's okay. And it, again, it's amazing that this was done in Tokyo. You know, I mean, the Japanese can build anything, and they do build anything. This is this architecture is almost the opposite of the architecture by Kazuyo Sejima or even Ishigami and uh, and uh, also Fujimoto, because they work with uh, very refined, uh, you know, planes and uh, white is uh, al almost always there. Whiteness here there is some vitality. Now you will see another very interesting enterprise of theirs, the site of Reversible Destiny, which was their foundation in the Euro Park in Japan. And uh, an ample uh, work. Uh, they even built a library and some kind of headquarters. And it's a park. How they got that uh, land in a, in, a, in, a, in a country where the density of people is uh, well known and um, anyway it, it, it's a uh, they got it <laughs> so this is the i think the their headquarters which reminds me very much of some studies i did and if you want i can show them to you uh, some of them because uh, i was obsessive as i am obsessive now with presentations i was obsessive with when when a, a young architect introduced me to the mysteries of architect seven uh, I, I dedicated some time to uh, an obsessive uh, love affair with it so i produced all kinds of uh, so-called studies very similar to what they did here actually uh, i would create uh, uh, several a day uh, and working in a, from a very unconventional position laying in bed on my back and there was the monitor on the other side of the bed and I, with a, with a mouse, so I, 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 I created these things. I really enjoyed it actually. And you know how I work? I work by emptying myself of my will. I just wanted to get rid of my will. And I don't know if I succeeded, but that's what I tried. And I kind of found, it was therapeutic. There are two things that uh, for me are very therapeutic. One is to create uh, uh, what I call uh, found architectures or pre-architectures or para-architectures or meta-architectures with ARCHICAD 7 and not only ARCHICAD 7, ARCHICAD 7. I know uh, the program arrived the 22nd or 23, 23 uh, uh, 20, so you can imagine it's an antique version or to do PowerPoint presentations. Uh, both uh, uh, have a therapeutic uh, effect on me. Uh, but I, I like this building. It's, you don't know exactly you know, what is its function. It's, it's, uh, it's colorful and they, when you think of, because we talked about the Dutch architects, you know, about the steel. Uh, I mean, this is not a bad building. It's not a bad structure, maybe functionally, is not entirely convincing because a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sculptural elements here without uh, maybe a definite uh, function, but it's okay. Uh, I don't think it's the worst building ever built. No, it's not. 
Now, the site of, of a possible library is actually was built and look at it. <laughs> I mean, who would have imagined such a library? I mean, really, is it that the library in Seattle by Ren Kolhas better? Of course, it's a much bigger building. It's in the center of uh, an important city, a big city. This is in nature, but uh, I don't know. I mean, if those philosophers thought that uh, there is something philosophical very profound in the works of Arakawa, I could speculate here also some meanings. I could express some, um, you know, uh, thoughts, uh, imagining certain meanings, looking at these pictures. What did they want to, to say with this building as being a library? It's more sculpture than architecture, but the relationship between architecture and sculpture is, uh, uh, exists, does exist, and uh, maybe it has a certain complexity. I wouldn't say what Brancus said, that uh, an, an inhabited sculpture is architecture, or architecture is an inhabited sculpture, no. But uh, they are related. And uh, I have seen a very predictable uh, library buildings. This is unpredictable. Now, if this is a virtue, uh, I don't know. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is not to be unpredictable. Also, the things, as you can see, there, there, are, there is instability here. But isn't the quest for knowledge also unstable? And shouldn't uh, uh, excessively stable environment uh, be actually somehow uh, uh, oppressive and, 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 and uh, um, not, um, not uh, offering the chance to, to continue to have the desire to learn. So maybe some instability and some dislocations are necessary. So this is a quotation from Arakawa, the best way to get a handle on how a person is situated in the world is actually to construct one, a handle expressly made for the purpose. I don't know exactly what he means by a handle, but um, anyway. Now this is the site where they have that um, library. It's, it's quite ample, it's a, it's a park, and there are several structures and uh, this is, uh, you know, the, some kind of arcosanti, um, uh, more surreal, uh, less interested with ecology. Uh, here you have some kind of Dada existentialist uh, who became uh, architects. Interesting work. And again, Homo Ludens is here. They play. Maybe the play was not always innocent, or sometimes was excessively innocent, uh, if, if we can say so, but uh, it is Homo Ludens present here. What amazes me again is that here you have people who didn't study architecture who actually built. And uh, I don't think they built so badly. I, I, I mean, uh, the work is interesting, it's provocative. So I, I continue to wonder, you know, uh, are really schools of architecture truly necessary? I am asking myself, how would, this, how would the world how, if the world didn't have architects, uh, 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 but people continue to build, of course, it, it would have been probably a, a different, a very different world. Maybe we would, would not have built very tall buildings or, you know, buildings technically extremely complex or complicated, but in terms of uh, ingenuity and color, and maybe it would have been a very, very interesting world. Anyway, a look at these buildings built by two people who never studied architecture. Uh, and, and society did trust them and uh, <laughs> the result can be seen. 
I do think, and, and maybe I'm not now very inspired in the choice of my words, but I do think we need, again, architects who are not just architects, but who are also philosophers, poets, uh, psychologists, theologians. Uh, even Wolf Prick said, you know, if you only think of architecture, what you'll get in the end will be only architecture. Although when I think of the Ise Shrine in, uh, in, in Japan, I mean, if you do just architecture, but with that devotion, with that extreme care, almost religious care for detail, for joining. In other words, if you don't speculate at, uh, uh, at all, you might actually get an architecture that transcends itself. Like Palladio. Palladio was, if we can say so, just an architect. He was not a painter, he was not a sculptor, he was not a philosopher, but he built magnificently. So, and now I turn against myself. It's, I think it is possible also to, do, to have great architecture that was built so-called just by an architect, but, but, but a sensitive architect and an educated, uh, with an educated uh, heart, as Frank Lloyd Wright would put it. Okay, so uh, this is what they left behind them, these two interesting uh, people this couple, and I think uh, he deserves uh, a warm, a happy birthday from us today. As you can see, some structures are actually not perpendicular on the earth, and the, the last picture of my presentation, which will come soon, is uh, it shows that uh, is this one? This is the last picture of the of the presentation. So I ended with Arakawa and his wife, and I would be curious to hear some of your thoughts. Thank you very much, Dan. That was very exciting. What do you think of this this French couple? I, 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 I personally think that they didn't do architecture, they built philosophy. I mean, look at the last um, image that you showed. Yes. Uh, the, the, you know, the building is not perpendicular at all, it's leaning. What is the thoughts behind that? Why are they doing that? They're having, they're having fun, they're having life and uh, laugh, and they're questioning, and they're putting new ideas forward. I think I think is that is very engaging. That is very thoughtful. I admire them. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, I think I think you are right. Um, I think you are right. I wonder though why uh, architects by training don't do this more often or or or, or not at all or very rarely. Uh, Maybe because of the very training, you know, you are trained to, to, to respect so-called reality, to respect gravity, to respect the uh, functions. And I think uh, this uh, is in a way normal, but sometimes could be in inhibited. I read that an architect uh, born in, in, uh, in Israel, but who is now in, in the United States, he's actually a designer and he never studied architecture, he studied design and he declared in an interview, he's very successful. He builds an island now, I mean, a complex architectural program on an island in, 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 uh, in Turkey. He said, when I enter a competition, I have a better chance to win it than, than most architects. And he was asked, why? And he said, well, because, exactly because I was not trained as an architect. So I don't have uh, the inhibitions they have. So I, I, I can surprise my, my prospective clients with uh, unexpected, uh, you know, so-called solutions. While for an architect, it's very difficult, unless uh, that architect was, uh, you know, at war with a school and uh, was able to keep his or her, uh, you know, uh, even so-called crazy ideas uh, alive. But schools, I think, do have a, a, an impact on, on students, you know, because uh, go, it's a long program, you know, five, six years. Uh, 
you know, some study a little bit less, but, uh, you know, to study for five, six, six years, even if you are very strong uh, and stubborn, I think uh, the school does have an effect on you. And uh, you, you, you would not easily do something like that these people did. So it was their change that they didn't study architecture. Yes, they were serious, maybe they were profound. Yes, they were talented, but they didn't have the inhibitions that come with a conventional training in architecture, which has some qualities, but also has some problems, I think. What I find quite fascinating, if I may add, is um, that they were quite consequent and consistent in, in building their own reality completely. It's a complete project, right? So um, they declared they're not going to die if they live in this house. Um, they sort of declared what for them is reality. And the way what they built or what came is just part of their reality in a sort of a manifestation in physical form, right? Right. So, so I, I find this quite, quite fascinating. So they say like, I want to be reality such. This is how I perceive it. And we do it. And we do everything which is needed to, to, to live that way. If it works out in the end, of course it didn't, but, uh, you know, they died. But I mean, I find it very, very powerful and very brave. Um, I mean, I don't have to agree on some aesthetic choices and so on and so forth, but what I'm finding very fascinating is sort of like this utmost consequence of saying, you know, I construct my own world and I do everything for it. Very good, Florian. And in fact, what you said is in uh, accordance with what uh, Arakavak himself said. And I remember, the, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, the, the Institute of Architecture, the School of Architecture, uh, which is not a large school, which is part of the University of Applied Arts. There, the uh, provost of the school declared very openly that education is the one that carries re so-called reality after it. That that education is the the the, the engine that 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 uh, uh, it, it, that refuses to be manipulated by the so-called reality because it creates reality. And and uh, uh, you, you, well, I come back to <laughs> I come back to Wolf Briggs because he was the dean there for a number of years. And he said the same thing. He said, reality doesn't make us. We make reality. Now, of course, it's easy to say. It's difficult to do. But I do believe that education, education uh, is, is meant to, to assume the, this responsibility to transform life, to transform society, and, and, and not to be manipulated by reality. Because then you become the slave of reality and 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 you lose your your significance. You you lose uh, you lose your 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 raison d'être. In fact, so this yeah. people, yes, you are right. They were very uh, 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 almost stubborn in, 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 on their path, and they they yes, and they have to be admired. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because if you talk about education, education is always something an institution set in place by by the state, by the government, right? And um, we can now debate about um, the institution as such and, and, and the purpose, if the purpose is only um, to educate people or to uh, <laughs> do other things to people. But I mean, these two guys, they clearly put themselves, they set themselves outside the society, outside what is perceived as the sort of the status quo. And by doing so, they consequently created their own reality. So they freed themselves from all the shackles, right? Um, so maybe they don't have to free themselves from an architectural education because they didn't have one. But yeah, I find this quite fascinating. This is very powerful in a way to be able to step outside and just say like that. I don't care what you're doing. I'm just doing what, what, what we are thinking is right. And we do this like, you know, either we succeed or we fail. We don't care. I mean, it reminds me a little bit to these um, 
Spanish guy who started to build his own cathedral. And he's doing this since like 30, 40 years. I don't know if he's still alive, but you know, he's hand building his own cathedral. He's actually quite far with it. He's just living on the building side and he's doing this. It's really amazing. You know, it's just like somebody being able to say like, I don't care what society thinks about me or what society expects from me. I just do what I think is right. This is, yeah, uh, this has to, must be applauded in a way for this, this braveness. Anyone else wants to say something? Uh, for me, um, <clears throat> his building in Tokyo uh, reminded me of uh, Tom Wiscombe's um, uh, very uh, discreet uh, buildings. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, he reminded me of uh, the discreet character of uh, Tom Wiscombe's work, which are like an assemblage of toy-like parts. And uh, this idea of uh, collage of toy parts uh, actually impressed me in, uh, in that Tokyo building. And I think this idea was, could have influenced Tom Wiscombe, for example. This also relates to, uh, uh, I, I discovered uh, uh, an interesting idea about uh, urbanism uh, called aggregate urbanism. Uh, and uh, yeah, which is a kind of an urbanism appropriate for our time, which is in a way uh, some kind of a collage of, of uh, various parts. You mentioned, uh, you know, fragments of toys. Imagine frag fragments of buildings, uh, uh, you know, being assembled informally and, and, and playfully uh, against the Cartesian dogma, uh, against the uh, so-called reason or rationality. Anyway, uh, but, but when you look at this work, uh, you feel encouraged to uh, attempt something similar in terms of uh, joyous exploration. <clears throat> and I, I, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, in that sense, yes, they died, but uh, they actually didn't die because their ideas are still, I think, uh, uh, provocative and, and, and uh, I, I don't know, they stimulate me and I imagine they stimulate other people. So. In a way, they won. I mean, uh, I don't know how seriously they they really believe that they would live forever, but <laughs> obliquely they achieve that through their work. Anyway, if no one else wants to say something else, we can go to the third uh, presentation on the other Dutch architect. But I'm I'm open to again if if because this 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 couple is. Uh, uh, was is remarkable. Or we could have a discussion afterwards because, uh, well, now uh, maybe I didn't uh, choose correctly the order of the presentations because Mr. Dudok, uh, he is uh, maybe not so uh, spectacular, although he's considered um, the, fa the father of modernism in, in, in the Netherlands. Although I think there were several fathers, just like in the case of uh, Sullivan, but the media likes these kind of expressions, you know, the father of modernism. So it is his birthday too, and in this way we complete the, the, the triple treat with the birthdays today. So I will start with uh, talking about um, about Mr. Dudok, who was a very important architect. Uh, and you will see why. Okay, again, I am amazed and I will continue to be amazed about the, the, the prolificity of, uh, of the Dutch culture in the field of art and in the field of architecture. How many good architects they had and still have? Uh, it's incredible for a country which is not so big really. I mean, they have about uh, 17 million people, 18, I don't know. Maybe it helps because the, uh, between 15% and 18%, I think, of the country is under the level of the sea. So maybe that is the dislocation, the disruption, the uncomfortable side of living in, in the Netherlands that, that enhances creativity, kind of like 
the discomfort of the architecture of Arakawa and, and, and his partner and wife. You know, maybe it helps, you know, and the countries that are much more uh, uh, teased and, and, and spoiled even, you know, especially the countries in the South, uh, uh, you know, there they is to be a little more complacent. I don't know. There are other reasons, and I, I'm, I'm sure Florian and uh, Daliana know more about this. And, and in fact, uh, Florian even said a few things last night that I think are valid and interesting. So this is Mr. Dudok. Um, I hesitate to <laughs> read the other two names he has because I'm, I'm afraid I will not pronounce them correctly. Now, the prequel is not Mr. Dudok, but uh, the owner of that uh, you know, uh, suit is him. Um, you know, he is a three piece suit, and uh, you know, <laughs> his uh, architects usually dress kind of well, with the exception of Renzo Piano. I will never understand why Renzo Piano has such a bad taste in clothing. Because, okay, architects in general dress well. Architects that, who are Italian are supposed to be magnificent in this field because they are Italians and he's Italian and he's an architect, but dress is, in fact, I think he shouldn't be allowed to decide himself how to dress. It's, uh, I don't know if you saw pictures, I'm sure you saw pictures. Of him. I mean, he has this, you know, he uses these impossible colors for his sweaters. And it's, it's I don't know, I, I, sometimes only Sir Norman Foster can compete with him in terms of bad taste. Did you see Sir Norman Foster with a pink, a uh, belt, uh, a pink belt, you know, I mean, maybe I am old fashioned, you know, I expect the belt to be either brown or black, but pink, and then with a, you know, a flowered shirt, and I don't know, it's too, almost kinky for my taste, but again, maybe I am uh, too conventional in my thing. Some drawings of Mr. Dudok, um, he, I don't know all the details, but I think he was involved with, uh, he had some military education and uh, apparently this had some effect on, 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 on his formation and on his architecture, respectively. Now, again, we look here, 1884. So let's say when he was 25, he, it was 1920, right? Well, in 19, no, it was 1910. 1910, 1920, well, at that time to make such an architecture was not very common. So he was breaking new ground, no doubt. Now the city hall from 1928, so he was uh, about 40 years old. Uh, he built uh, several important buildings. This is uh, one of the most important, if not the most important. Uh, it, you know, it, it is impressive. You know, maybe that tower is a little bit too, too, too emphatically proclaiming its uh, verticality. I don't know, but. Uh, it's a very fine building and uh, it has even that uh, lake uh, in its proximity, which adds something to the, to the you know, the complexity of, 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 uh, of the design. That there is nature, but there is also the geometry of man and it's a geometry that is not rigid. It's a fine building and, you know, it was done uh, you know, 80 years ago, more than 80 years ago. Uh, it is remarkable. And it's, it's, it's kept very well also. I mean, even in terms of details, we see here some very refined, I mean, I mean he was certainly a, a very astute and, 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 uh, and, and fine designer, you know. He, Look at these details here, uh, you know, and uh, I think even Frank Lloyd Wright would have loved this building. It, it's very well done. Uh, 
and it's it's a complex building uh, it's a large building i like very much this this canopy here it's asymmetrical but it looks stable and it's refined in detail and it's it's it's, it's an excellent work So the father of modernism in, in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, is considered to be Mr. Dudok, about whom not too many people talk, at least uh, outside of the Netherlands. I, I didn't meet too many people who know of him, but, but he, he was and he is a major architect. You could almost say I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something almost unacceptable, but uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a modern Taj Mahal. God, please forget what I said, what I just said. But I don't know why I thought of the Taj Mahal now, because it's so clean and so it's not symmetrical, of course, but it's a monument to, to modernity in a way. It's a city hall, it's not a mausoleum. It looks good even reflected in the water. Uh, for someone who likes uh, dualities, uh, here is an occasion for admiration. Maybe we should have always uh, near a building some, some some piece of water, something. You know, I, I don't. I forgive me for the words I chose. How could I say a piece of water? Sounds terrible. Well, you understand what I meant, but please forgive the, the choice of the words. Of course, in terms of working the brick, the Dutch are, are almost unbeatable. They are, they are masters. You know. They know something about bricks in as much as they know something about bicycles. It's impeccably built. I don't know about these uh, little windows here, you know, they are already small and to divide them again in nine even smaller squares is uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, strange, I think, but uh, I don't know, this is uh, the real building, what is here, but whatever it is, is, is a nice picture. Well, people are working to keep the building uh, clean and, and nice, and in good shape. It's a city hall after all. Now a school from 1921, so 80 years ago, kind of similar, you know, I mean, he has, he has a certain uh, mannerism almost, you know, in terms of, the way he composes the volumes and, you know, uh, with a vertical in the corner and... Uh, uh, may I ask you something? How do you see his relationship to write? To write? Yeah. I mean, this volumetric and um, certain elements, don't you see some form of um, resemblance or um, yeah, relation? There is, Florian, and I think uh, the experts commented on this. It's not mm. very sure uh, for me. I, I discussed this with Bruce too. Uh, mm. if, if, if Wright was influenced by, uh, well, at that time Wright was uh, around 50 years old. I know Wright was very appreciated in the Netherlands. And, uh, and, uh, it's possible that actually he had an influence on on someone like Dudo, but I could be wrong. It, it, it's something worth worthy of some investigation, I think. But there is a relationship, yes. Although you can almost say, but maybe I say it because I know he's European and uh, Franklin Wright is not, he's American. 
but there, there, there is there is there is some some relationship yes although maybe uh, right would have never used this kind of windows this kind of windows only Le Corbusier used it uh, in, uh, in his office at the Mediterranean Sea which is amazing you know because we associate uh, Le Corbusier with a horizontal uh, window <laughs> But he gave up, gave up the, the horizontal window, and there is a funny picture. At first, I thought I was hallucinating in his uh, so-called office, which is uh, like two meters by three meters, uh, <laughs> at, at the Mediterranean Sea near Le Cabanon, and it has this kind of window, a little bit narrower and a little bit taller. Yes, that was the office of the great master. I actually like this uh, picture. I don't know, is it the same building? Uh, but I always like the past, so I'm a nostalgic man. By the way, uh, today a student, uh, I don't know if she, no, no, she, I don't think she's a student and, and uh, it might be she's actually here, maybe she can tell us because she proposed to, to show her work that she did at the University of Nottingham in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, by the way of the theme, uh, architecture nostalgia and i i do think we could make a very interesting uh, meeting together talking and showing works relating to this theme architecture nostalgia uh, maybe nostalgia is not always beneficial to architecture but but on the other hand maybe uh, uh, reflecting on what nostalgia means uh, could uh, help us understand certain things about our relationship with the past. I remember when I lived in the United States, I did some incredibly inappropriate designs. You know, I didn't know, I didn't notice that I was actually longing for the culture of my native country. I was not aware that I was nostalgic. But if you see the projects, I did a house, uh, a school uh, of fine arts for Alabama, of all places, uh, and uh, and you know it's almost ridiculously nostalgic towards the, the the city where I was born in, which was almost the opposite of that uh, city in uh, Alabama. Anyway, nostalgia does exist, and I think we we should assume it and and reflect on it and and uh, and talk about it. Uh, another fine building, yes, he was no doubt a very good architect, even in this building, you know. Uh, it's a very fine building. If you build a building like this today, you wouldn't be ashamed of yourself. I wouldn't. I think even Wright would have liked it. Uh, you can tell from the car that this is not a contemporary building. Now this was destroyed in the Second World War as many buildings in Rotterdam have been. This is resolutely modern. I mean, this is even more, more so-called modern than some buildings by Rem Kolkas. It's uh, incredible. It was built in uh, 1930. So 90 years ago, almost 100 years ago, a department store. But look how elegant it was. And yes, with an almost uh, surreal modernity. Look at the cars in front of it. It's unbelievable. And you look at the cars and you look at the building and you say these are, the cars belong to another era and the building belongs to the future or to, you know, Maybe even a distant future is, uh, it's amazing. You would not say yes. that this is a building from 1930. This is, this is incredible. It's really, wow. <laughs> yes, it this, is. This horizontality, this sort of, uh, it's, it's like a, yeah, like a spaceship or a ship or something, something which wants to, to leave actually, doesn't want to stay, this, this horizontal these swoosh lines. It's very interesting. So sad it was destroyed, you know. It is. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. 
Yeah, a great building. I, this was the project, and this is the building. It even looks better built. Yeah, the, the drawn perspective is, is, is humble uh, in comparison to the photograph. Right, right. Yes, a great building. Now, what is this uh, Stadt who is, uh, is a city hall? I don't know uh, Dutch. Yes, Stadt ha has. So it, it's, it's a, a city hall now? Yes. Yeah. Another fine building, you know. Uh, yeah, e even if you didn't know what it was, you kind of think it, it is a city hall. Another architect, well, not from uh, the Netherlands, whom I admire a lot, and uh, one day we'll talk about him, is Gunnar Asplund in Sweden. He also has a, a city hall, which is magnificent. He has a few other works. Unfortunately, he died uh, rather young. A great, great architect. And Alvar Aalto had uh, the highest reverence for, for Gunnar Asplund. His time will come, his birthday will come, and uh, also the birthday of, uh, of another magnificent architect from Sweden, Sigurd Leverens. Uh, less known, but uh, remarkable architect, Sigurd Leverens. And they built together in the, in the cemetery, uh, municipal cemetery in, in Stockholm, some very, very interesting uh, structures. Great architects, very inspiring. Okay, this is a monument, uh, but uh, I, I don't know what for it was uh, built. It's a fine building, you know, modernistic. It, it is emphatic, but not in a crushing way. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, soldiers or uh, figurative art to embarrass the building. And, and the viewer is, 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 a, is a fine building. No, he was a sophisticated architect, Dudo, no doubt. I mean, Afslite Dyke then is a, is a very big dike to protect the Dutch from the, from the flood, from the sea flood. So it is, uh, I think, one of the monuments for, the, for this uh, achievement in defending the Netherlands from the water. So, uh, uh, Daniana, I didn't understand, so... Uh, Maybe you could translate. Uh, well, this is, I guess, the location of the monument. No, this this word, which is impossible for me to read, but you said that this monument uh, celebrates what or pay, pays homage to what? I uh, sorry, I didn't understand. Right, a uh, dike is a is a is a strategy, water engineering strategy to prevent the water to get into the land. The country, so it's it's basically um, a very big dike, and I think Upslide Dike, if not mistake, I'm not mistaken, the biggest dike. Maybe Florian, yeah. can you help? So um, yeah, I'm also not entirely sure, but so the Upslide Dike is a, a, a dam, right? Um, so it's a major dam um, which disconnects um, part of the inland water, the binnen uh, water of the Netherlands, with the with the sea water, and it was a humongous uh, engineering project. Um, in, in the 1920s, 30s. And um, for instance, uh, Lelystad, uh, all these uh, cities, they were reclaimed land which was previously completely underwater. So um, as you already mentioned earlier, parts of the Netherlands are completely under the sea level. So what nobody really knows is that, uh, you know, that pump millions of liters of water out of the Netherlands every day and you know they have uh, rivers and dikes and stuff like this where the water runs above actually the, the, the level where you build the building so if um, these dikes would break um, you know two-thirds of the Netherlands would be immediately underwater so and the Afslaut stake is really a monument in engineering of uh, protecting the Netherlands from uh, um, seawater and I guess uh, that's uh, that's the monument for it. Thank you very much for, for telling us, telling me this, yes, I um, understand.
Yeah, it is a nation to be admired. Uh, you know, hard work and, and um, ingenuity. And, uh, yeah. I mean, even inside, you know, it's not an ordinary building. It's, uh, it, has, it has character. Okay, Cité Universitaire in, in Paris, the College of, uh, of, of the Dutch of, of, uh, of the Netherlands in 1939. Um, a little bit in the spirit of the previous buildings that we saw. not as well kept as those in the Netherlands, but uh, it's in Paris, so maybe this explains it. Uh, sorry for the a little, you know, a little bit of maliciousness there. Um, no, because it is a difference between uh, how the buildings were protected and kept in, in the Netherlands and how it is. Now, of course, you could say also the Dutch are responsible in this case as well for the building. Here it looks better. Maybe those pictures were uh, older or something. Yeah, it looks much better. Anyway, um, so a trip to Paris would give you a chance to see a building by Dudok right there. And of course, at the Cité Universitaire, you can see also the two buildings by Le Corbusier and uh, there are other riches there. Uh, that's probably him there, the architect, you know, uh, or maybe not. <laughs> Looks a little bit like him. Interesting, the, the lighting, you know, with the, the, the dressing of the... I never saw something like this before. Now it's very well kept. I, I was totally wrong. It is very well kept, the building. <laughs> Maybe too well kept. It had to be because it belongs to the Dutch, you know, and they are not playing games. Uh... Can you go back to the slide before? Then there was a map of Indonesia there. Yes. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> well, it, uh, Indonesia was a colony, you know, of, uh, of, of, of the Dutch, no? Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. When, when, when did it gain its independence? 1945. In 19... 17 August, by the way. So if you like, we can do an Indonesian, you know, architecture talk on the 17th of August, because that's, that's the Independence Day. Yes, let's do it then. It would be, it would, it would be very appropriate, yes. Okay. 17th of August, okay. We'll do it. The Dutch had a very interesting trick. When they portrayed the map of the Netherlands next to the uh, Indone map of Indonesia, they scaled it up completely. So the Netherlands you looked huge on a map next to uh, Indonesia, even though it's a tiny country with uh, now 16 million people. This is some of their ingenuity engineering tricks, I would say. <laughs> really? Yes. This is how you keep power, you know. You know, I, I Florian, I read that some, some the, someone or some people did, uh, no, no, someone did uh, some maps uh, of the world where the the physical uh, reality of, uh, of space, the geographical truth, was not mm. respected. You know. Oh, and, did kind of in this spirit that you mentioned. Uh, no, but this is all, all, most of our maps are uh, sort of um, bringing more focus to the north than to the south. The south is uh, very small, the north is blown up. Um, also the relationship, of course, if you look at the maps of Buckminster Fuller, uh, it's completely different. But, you know, maps are power. power because who has the map, who has the trade routes, has the economic and the political power. So, I mean, maps were really the biggest trade secret a couple of hundred years ago. And if you gave a map away, you were executed because you gave uh, uh, trade secrets away. 
So uh, they were safeguarded like crazy. So maps literally were power and the way how you would communicate the size and importance of your country versus another one was just another political tool. Yes. Anyway, now uh, we went uh, uh, three years in a row to Vienna with, uh, I went with about 300 uh, students in architecture and the rooms in the, uh, the Erasmus house in Vienna where we stayed were almost identical with these two. Uh, I think uh, the architects who built it in the uh, 1980s, 90, early 90s, uh, maybe saw the, this room by Dudok, I don't know. Of course, you, you, you cannot modify too much, you know, it's a, you know, approximately small room. So I guess that, but really it was very, very similar. Even those, uh, you know, drawers in the center and the table from, uh, you know, one wall to the other and two beds just like that. Uh, I thought of it when I created the PowerPoint presentation. Anyway. I love that uh, uh, Erasmus house. And next year, I want to invite all of you who are here now to Vienna because it will be the uh, Vienna uh, uh, biennial in art, architecture, and design. And uh, let's hope the pandemic will be, uh, you know, will disappear by then. Uh, and uh, you can stay extremely comfortably uh, in this uh, great. Uh, the dorm uh, for Erasmus students right in the center of Vienna and it's very, very, very inexpensive. It's quite a treat and uh, Vienna is Vienna. So I, I uh, recommend it strongly. A summer vacation uh, in Vienna next year if the pandemic, let's hope, is, uh, is defeated. Now, so, uh, City Theatre in Utrecht. Uh, well, this is maybe a little bit less impressive than the city hall and uh, the other buildings he built. But um, anyway, it doesn't have to be necessarily impressive. You know, maybe a theater is just sometimes a, a mechanism that has to function well, and uh, maybe it's just fine if there are no rhetorics uh, involved at all. I kind of like though the building behind it, but it's probably not by Dudok. Uh, it's not by Dudok. Anyway, um, now we are approaching the end of this presentation and he, uh, in, in his later years, he did some gas stations for Exxon, of all companies. Uh, uh, I only found the images with one of them and uh, this is it. <laughs> it's kind of uh, a little bit burlesque. I used the word burlesque three times, I think. Uh, I, I have to be careful not to use it the fourth time. But it, it is, it's in a way, Dutch and it's joyous and it's, uh, it's almost uh, mignon, you know. It's, it's, it's at that time, I think, uh, when was it built? It doesn't say, but I imagine, you know, in the 70s or so. Um, these gas stations didn't have the aggressivity of, of the present. You know, they were, you see, not very ample and uh, no large monumental canopy designed by uh, uh, Calatrava or anything like that. <laughs> it's a, you know, there is a, a very amusing moment in, the, in, a, in a great movie by, for me, the greatest film director ever, director ever, Ingmar Bergman, I'm talking about wild strawberries, where a doctor arrives at a gas station and uh, the owner of the gas station recognizes him. He acknowledges that this doctor saved the life of someone in his family. And uh, the, the doctor wanted to pay for the gasoline, for the gas. And that person tells him, doctor, certain things cannot be paid, not even with gas. And I, I, I like the, the subtle humor of Ingmar Berman, you know, because the value of gas, I mean, you, certain things you cannot pay for, 
no team win with gas. <laughs> Here's Magnificent Berman. In, in your place, I would never come back to uh, presentations on Zoom. I would just watch movies by Berman. And he made many, but this man was, was without doubt, uh, no, no, he was, I think he was the greatest uh, film director ever. Although he thought that uh, Andrei Tarkovsky was, and he was Andrei Tarkovsky, uh, truly great, but somehow I think, uh, plus he, he created more than 40 movies, Bergman, he's considered a dark film director, but uh, he also has a, uh, a subtle form of humor, a, a, a remarkable man, uh, Berman. Anyway, we are approaching the end. We say goodbye to the ESO uh, gas station, and that's it. We said uh, goodbye, good happy birthday to uh, Mr. Willem, 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 Willem Dudok. Uh, there is a middle name uh, that, that starts with M, and. Uh, we paid our duty to three interesting architects. Uh, the second one was an artist architect. Now uh, it's, uh, we spent two hours together. So what do you think? What should we do next? The 13 people that are here besides me. I have something else prepared, but I don't want to tire you uh, bec uh, because I, I, I do have a tendency to be uh, excessive and I, I need to be tempered. But if you, <laughs> if you like excessive, excessiveness, I prefer something uh, relating to the, what the Japanese did. So uh, you decide. Well, let's see the, the audience. Well, I don't see anything now. What I prepared was another PowerPoint presentation with what I call found architectures. <clears throat> Maybe you know that uh, Marcel Duchamp uh, uh, had a very famous sculpture called, let's call it sculpture, but it was called sculpture and it probably cost a fortune, a uh, found object. You know, uh, he, uh, so, I, I prepared the uh, material with found architectures. What does it mean, a found architecture? It's an architecture that you didn't search for. It's an architecture that you found. Uh, in the same way, maybe you know, uh, and I, I said this before, Frank, uh, uh, Picasso said, I do not search, I find. And what is the relationship between searching and finding? Usually in architecture, we start with, with uh, an analysis, we search for various things and then we search for the so-called solution. But what if you do an architecture which doesn't, which doesn't search for anything? It just finds, it, it, it is just found without being searched for. Can you imagine an architecture that is found but not searched for? This was, uh, this was what I was trying to, uh, you know, uh, address in this uh, material, which I hesitate to, um, to show because, um, I, I, again, I, I, I don't want to... Sometimes, you know, it is said that re good restaurants, uh, they don't give you enough food. They give, they, they give you just almost enough food, uh, enough food. So uh, when you leave, you, you still have a little bit of longing for having a little more. So then you'll come back to that restaurant. Now that kind of wisdom I do not have, but maybe I should train myself to have. That is, you know, to know to stop at a certain moment and then people would, uh, would have that space of freedom where they can choose to, to return instead of uh, leaving dwarfed by too much offerings anyway. You decide. If you want, I can show you that uh, it's not so long, but, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, actually with uh, some photographs and some of my uh, architectural uh, scribblings. Yes, why not? Let's go. Uh, Azar, I was hoping that you would say no. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, because uh, I, I will become vulnerable, you know. As long as I didn't show my work, I was, you know, kind of, you know, safe. But now if I show you certain things that I did or do, uh, you know, I'm opening myself up to criticism and, uh, uh, you know, 
I and you are safe with us. Pardon? You are safe with us. Well, <laughs> you are proven yourself. I don't know. What, the, what do the others think? I, I can show it very quickly if, if you want, but uh, you will see a very, you know, in a way, um, you know, uh, I don't know if I can describe myself. I'm not very happy, but, but, but you'll see some of my so-called works. Actually, they are not works, they are work plays. <laughs> Come on, everybody else, uh, you have, you, you tell me, we, either we continue the discussion or we end our meeting or I'll show you this uh, fourth. Uh, uh, and then please go ahead. Who was this? <laughs> What's all? Uh, okay. All right, I'll show you, you know, I, uh, you know uh, if it's meant for me to, to see or hear you for the last time, let it be. I mean, no, no, uh, no, I cannot say let it be. Okay, uh, do, do you see the screen now? You don't because I think I, I, uh, I uh, okay, you'll see it now. But, you know, please understand that, uh, and is, you know, when you begin with an excuse is not good, I know this, but I prepare this really very, very quickly. I have a huge amount of uh, workplace or scribblings in fact, too big to be uh, managed properly, even by a better administrator than I am. I, you'll just see a, a, a few things that somehow connect with a Japanese couple in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, I, I assume levels of freedom that are almost un unacceptable for an architect. So I begin. Uh, so I call them found architectures. Maybe the word architectures is itself uh, a little bit uh, debatable, as is the word found. I could call them, and sometimes I don't know how to call them because they are not yet architectures. I could call them not yet architectures, or I could call them pre-architectures, or I could call them, as I said, uh, meta-architectures, or uh, uh, para-architectures, or I don't know. This, or uh, has uh, 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 circumstantial architectures because they were born uh, by emptying myself of will. And, uh, and, uh, and so as such, they were found, but not really searched for. This is a possible skyscraper. I was just playing with uh, domino uh, pieces. And, you know, <laughs> I was really a kid myself. I was playing. But it could be built just like this. I, I didn't plan to, any, to do anything. I was just putting one, one block above another block, one piece above another piece, and I got this, and then I took a picture. And I'm not totally ashamed of it. You know, it's, it could be a building. And I, if I had an office with some uh, uh, well-educated well, uh, well uh, people, uh, we could transform this into a very interesting building. But I don't have that office and do I, I don't have myself, unfortunately, that knowledge, nor the, the patience and the, and the time to, to, to do it, but it can be done. So what I'm saying is, if you just play, like for example, I saw once a, a picture of uh, Alvaro Siza, uh, drawing on the floor. He was laying on the floor and he was actually doing architecture on the floor. And uh, sometimes I tell the students, why don't you try something like this at home to work on the floor? I think, I think it could have a beneficial uh, um, effect on your work because you become a toddler. And as a toddler, you act differently and you think differently. And and I think you become more playful and in a way more innocent. I didn't do this as a toddler. No, I didn't do it on the floor, but uh, I, was, I was kind of like a child playing with these uh, pieces. Anyway, here is another picture of it. And I want to stress something else. When you are playing, almost losing yourself, in, uh, it's almost like the Slovak peasant woman who crochet, who uh, uh, embroiders, uh, uh, you know, uh, sweater, or 
is crocheting the sweater. Here you are weaving a building also with some kind of a contemplative uh, um, state of mind, if I can say so. So uh, you are losing yourself in this putting uh, one piece above another piece, another, without a strong will or without too much determinism. And this confers uh, certain freedom here. And there is a hazard here that I welcome because I think, uh, and I sometimes say it, let's give chains a chance. Now, another possible structure here, you see some pictures of something very banal. Uh, I don't know, it was the, the wrapping of some, something that I bought. Uh, uh, well, the pictures are not great, but uh, you have a feeling of a possible you know, I mean, someone could say, wow, this was done with, uh, you know, scripting and programming. And, uh, you know, this was actually something I think I bought some potatoes in, was uh, holding the potatoes, this thing. <laughs> Any, anyway, of course, it is not architecture, but it could be some kind of interesting structure if we could, if we could uh, calculate it and, and build it, build it this way. And it could be mysterious and filters the light. And of course, Jean Nouvel comes to mind uh, to an extent, although he is less organic and less lyrical because he imposes uh, very strict geometry sometimes, especially in Abu Dhabi, that uh, spherical covering. The lighting is very nice there, but uh, I, I, I have some doubts about that centralized um, you know, fragment of a sphere that cupola. Anyway, uh, so these are just uh, some photographs. You will see a few other things that are not photographs. Um, okay, now it is in red, uh, I mean, with colors. So, you know, I guess these are small, uh, illustrations of the uh, even poetical or lyrical ly lyrical value of, of hazard because when i brought the potato scene i didn't think that i would uh, photograph the you know the, the bag that they were in for uh, aesthetical purposes or uh, in any way not related with architecture now you see a so-called project i did together with an architect uh, uh, a very generous young architect who helped me for years uh, with Icarj uh, 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 as a volunteer from Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, uh, she is now in, in New York. She's actually American. She was born in the United States, but from two parents who were doing their PhDs in, uh, in, in the United States. They are Egyptians and, uh, and uh, a very interesting architect herself. And she also um, had a, a postgraduate studies in Vienna at the Institute of Architecture with Hernan Diaz Alonso. So she helped me with uh, do, working in Maya, uh, what I uh, uh, suggested to her. So you will see her modeling of Maya, in Maya, of something that I thought could be the Museum of Knowledge, right in the proximity of, Chandi, uh, of the buildings by Le Corbusier in Chandigarh. This was a competition a few years ago, and I didn't know what to do. So one day I was going to buy some food and I found an object. That's why the title found architectures. I found an object kind of like, it looks sculptural, very small and very modest near the trunk of a tree, which I liked. So when I returned from buying some food, I took it, I went home, and I put it on a table, and contemplating it, I said, this is the museum. And you'll see pictures of it. First, you see the site plan of Chandigarh with the buildings by Le Corbusier, all of them, the Parliament, the Secretariat, the Palace of Justice, Tower of Shadows, and the Governor's Palace, which was not built. Then you'll see our proposal, which is here. Uh, where is the arrow? It's here. And, and uh, uh, then you'll see it in detail. This was supposed, this was the object that I found seen from above. I literally took this object 
And I said, Shakira, let's make a building out of it. And I know this is not how you are supposed to do architecture. I know this, yet I like this, this thing so much uh, that we began to try to make it into a building. This is the long elevation, the front elevation, the back elevation, the side elevation, and another side elevation. And now you see the actual uh, thing, I don't know how to call it, that I found with some pictures that I took, imperfect as they are. I really like this thing, but when I, when I found it on the sidewalk, uh, I, I never thought of seeing any relation between it and a possible uh, project being done from it. No, I just liked it for some reason. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the, 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 it didn't quite become a project because it was difficult. She was doing it in Maya and she had to make an active project so this was not photoshopping and she struggled but we did we kind of did it in the end it has uh, many issues but we did it and you are going to see it and as i said it's a found architecture just as just as uh, duchamp was finding a, you know a toilet seat or a, a bicycle the bicycle handles and transform them into sculptures we try to transform this object that we found into a building. Now you see a few pages with her, study, her working on the thing with Maya, and she is very meticulous and rigorous because uh, her parents are a great uh, uh, dentist. Um, her father was even the dean of the School of Stomatology in Alexandria. And uh, <laughs> so, what you see here is an anticipation of the final thing. In fact, it's not too far away from the so-called final thing. I would have never thought of something like this if I didn't find that thing on the sidewalk. Well, this thing on the, this is too rigid and uh, anyway, um, plus vegetation would have helped, but uh, she had no time to create vegetation. Uh, and you'll see the project as we sent it, but we are not sure it arrived in India because uh, uh, we didn't receive any, any proof of arriving there. It was sent digitally, maybe a little bit past the deadline. I'm not going to read the text, although the text is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, I even have a quotation from Rick Beda. I was asking myself, what is knowledge? And I, I, I sympathized with what I read in that uh, fragment from uh, Rig Veda. If any of you is interested in the text, I could send it to you. Uh, this is a fragment of the, of the, of the print of, well, we didn't send prints, uh, you know, the, the format that was asked. And uh, the, <laughs> you know, the people who were supposed to use the, of course, uh, they were yogi there and the modern uh, India is not like that, but uh, somehow I try to connect with them and not so much with uh, Anyway, so this was supposed to be uh, the Museum of Knowledge that we did, uh, me with Shakira, or should I say Shakira with me? Because my role was really minimal, it's just that I found that the actual work was done by her, not by me. You see the site plan in, in the right upper corner, uh, and yes, of course, this thing would have been totally different from the buildings by Le Corbusier. But maybe that would not have been totally wrong. I don't know. So uh, this is the Museum of Knowledge that we did. Uh, you know, this has some problems, but quickly I will show you some of her images that she generated for this thing through using Maya, uh, it has problems, but uh, she struggled. Anyway, the, the fascination with the cave, uh, many people have today. In fact, a doctoral student amusingly said that there is a cave revival, uh, <laughs> some kind of a style today. Arata Isozaki did it, uh, Ginny Gang did it, uh, even, uh, Toyo Ito did it, so many people are fascinated by the cave these days. 
And this is the top view and uh, the three sections through this thing. I call it the thing. Um, now she worked hard, uh, Shakira, a very, very reliable and, and loyal person and a very talented architect. Maybe too talented and almost idiosyncratically so. So these are the uh, sections through the building, uh, a little bit larger. And now you will see, uh, uh, because I, uh, I already told you that uh, I, uh, I love to, do, uh, to play with ArchiCAD 7, you will see some scribblings of mine, so-called architectural scribblings. Here I was working, but I didn't send anything to Budapest. Five museums, so this was supposed to be the house of music. Uh, this was the top view. And you can see now a little bit of a relationship with what Arakawa did. Of this, uh, I, and I, I even thought of, because I have ArchiCAD 7 installed on the laptop, maybe not now, but another day, I can, I can show you how to do such things in 10, 15 minutes. And, uh, you know, they, you, you could find some, some uh, satisfactions. I, I, I do, you know, it's, uh, it's rewarding. And it's very simple. And actually, uh, 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 as you know, ArchiCAD works with uh, architectural element, elements, with constructive elements. So what you see here are either roofs or uh, walls or uh, slabs. So th th this is not graphic art. This is, uh, um, this easily could be, could be uh, uh, transformed or, or developed into an architectural project. Now uh, the scale is debatable, I move on. Um, this was just one of the studies. Um, I like colors too, as you can see. And, uh, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I, 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 my problem is that I don't have, if there were a few people to, to help me, uh, because I'm deficient in, in, uh, in many respects with the, in relation with this uh, software, we could make it into a work, working project. In fact, the building that uh, Jean Nouvel did, uh, that uh, uh, a museum, uh, uh, is it in Abu Dhabi or Dubai? I, I, I'm, I'm confused now. No, no, in, uh, in, uh, in Qatar, I think. The latest one that he did. I used to do that sort of architecture <laughs> years ago because I started in 2002. And uh, one day I will show them to you. Now, uh, yeah, about six years ago, when uh, inappropriately I, I was uh, frustrated in, in, the, in the difficult field of love. And uh, on, on the 14th of February, I designed, if I can say so, uh, in exasperation, I, I, I drew about 40 houses of love, four zero or 45, I didn't count them all. And you'll see some of them. Done also with the only thing that I know besides AutoCAD, this is ArchiCAD 7. And it shows this stress, of course. Um, uh, another pre-architecture, this was supposed to, I, this I did for Como, the, the city in Italy. I forgot exactly why, I think for a competition, I myself launched. Uh, it's kind of similar to what I did in Budapest, so it was nothing, uh, you know, was not innovative really. Then you'll see another sketch because this is it is unfortunately it's just a sketch for a Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki, the competition, but I didn't send it. And uh, this is uh, this unfortunately I do very often. I do I do some works. Maybe they cannot be truly called projects uh, all the way. And uh, and because I know it, in the end I don't send them. I did this many times, you know. Uh, uh, sometimes I didn't have the money to ship uh, some big boards from uh, New York to Oslo when I did the first underwater opera, the one that was built by Snoheta. I did a project and one day, if I can call it a project, I did a six boards, uh, I did them in pastel and, uh, you know, in a primitive way where I put the whole building under the water. Uh, and uh, I thought, that this would be the first underwater opera. I had a whole theory about it and even a quotation from Henny Gibson. Anyway, Snoheta won it. 
unfortunately, uh, the, the Norwegians who were asking for an unbelievable uh, registration fee was 700 euros just to enter the competition. And uh, since, uh, you know, <laughs> in the field of money, I was always uh, very timid, not to put it some other way. Uh, I didn't, I didn't send it, but I have the boards and now there are some uh, squirrels and uh, maybe some animals enjoying them in the attic of, uh, of an apartment uh, somewhere in, in Transylvania. This was uh, an initial sketch, kind of in the same way I'm aware of the repetition, but in the end I did something else. So this was the site, maybe you know it was a famous competition. Fortunately, fortunately, uh, it was not built, uh, the work that was... Uh, no, no, I'm wrong about this. Actually, uh, uh, Mark Wigley and Ginny Gang chose, there were others in the jury, chose correctly. The one who won was, I think, did a good project. A team uh, between a, a Frenchman and the Japanese uh, architect, uh, he and the she. And they did a good work, and I don't know what will happen if it will be built. But that, that is the side that you see there. And what I just sketched, and there is nothing else but a sketch, is this one. So this is the top view of my proposal, if I can call it so. Uh, again, that with ARCHICAD 7. And uh, I, I know that uh, glass is not uh, you know, uh, very uh, beneficial to artworks because it allows but there are mechanisms uh, and uh, there are ways to, to, to stop the sunlight to strike the artworks. And this was, I, I called it, uh, uh, the, the icebergs are melting, uh, long, uh, long live the iceberg, something like this. So I, it's not that I wanted to create this. I found it without searching for it. I found it some kind of an iceberg uh, like, let's call it building and uh, it has some problems because i didn't know how to for example this line is too straight i would have broken it at a certain angle make it a little more uh, uh, a fable in a way I, I i didn't know how to do it but the intention was was this one and um, you know you could like it, you could dislike it. This was a sketch I did, which I didn't send. Uh, just a thought, you know. Then another house, uh, so-called house. Uh, you see, I think you can, you can find architectures, possible architectures without searching for them. Uh, again, you could like it or you could dislike it, but, but you, can, you can create certain things plainly without searching for uh, something necessarily. Uh, okay, I don't insist because I don't think that they are, you know, uh, anyway, great works. I just wanted to show the value of playing and the value of color and the value of also a certain kind of, uh, you know, disorder, if you want. But, but I could make an interesting building of almost all of them, if I had uh, you know, a little help. This was another I was thinking could be an interesting uh, apartment building or something. Of course, for me, it was, uh, I was thinking about my, my, my frustrations in the, in, the, in the sentimental field. Uh, and uh, this was what you see here with the black or gray, they are, they are uh, cuts, as it is actually uh, obvious here into the, um, I don't know how to call them, these parts of, you know, possible building, building uh, corps. Or like this, <laughs> of course it's not yet architecture, but it could become architecture. This, this could be a housing complex. This is another one where I was a little bit wilder. I was working just with roofs, you know, one red, one yellow, one black, and without thinking, as Wolf Creek would, uh, would, uh, would say, I produce this plainly. Now, this is one of the last ones, if not the last ones. Uh, if not the last one, is, uh, this one is uh, a little more spectacular, but also a little more difficult, complicated, but it's possible. 
uh, you can see, I guess, a certain relationship, at least with the last structure that I showed in that park by that couple, uh, the Japanese and the American uh, architect poet. Anyway, I don't insist. You just, you just, you have now uh, uh, another proof that I could be irresponsible. And this is also another possible house of love or house of other something, maybe hatred actually, uh, considering that uh, triangle that is so uh, unforgiving, but uh, it could be a house uh, because it was modeled, so to speak, with architectural elements, abstracted, of course, and that's it. Now, of course, you will have all the reasons to not show up to the last, to the following uh, presentation. And I, I would have no reason at all to, to blame you for anything. Well done, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> I have many other things, believe me. I mean, I, 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 uh, this was just something that I thought could be somehow related to uh, what the Japanese uh, Arakawa did and his, uh, his partner. But I, I, <laughs> I have many other things. Anyway, please say something. And if you are uh, in a critical mode, please do not hesitate. Florian, I'm expecting from you a reaction. Intelligent and piercing. If you are still here, Florian. I think Florian left. Uh, he wrote when he left that he has to sleep and he has to go. Some time I mean, ago. It means he didn't like what he saw, but. Uh, no, I think he left before you started uh, this presentation. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, you, you make me feel make me feel better, Andre. But then maybe you can say something. And then be well, I, I know, so I know some part of. Yes, uh, I know you know. Works. You know many. I like I like the colors and uh, this almost. Uh, uh, how to say? Uh, it has some a deconstructivist uh, atmosphere <laughs> somehow. Um, I like uh, yeah, I like th this. Uh, I like the colors and the sharp angles. Uh, this agitated uh, atmosphere. Of, uh, Andre, uh, uh, don't mind. please tell me what you don't like, not what you like. And uh, Alexandra the same, and uh, uh, Nazar, and then after uh, uh, Fleming, uh, uh, Fleming, and David, Devina, and Diana, and uh, Vatsal. Please tell me mainly what you don't like. I'm more it interested is. what you didn't, what you didn't like than what you like. I could tell you what I doubt, and I, uh, and I doubt because I didn't see, for example, a plan or a section. I, I, I doubt the functionality, but that doesn't mean it cannot be. But that, I mean, I would, I, I would be interested in seeing maybe a plan of those houses or to see the connection between uh, this uh, free form uh, expression and uh, the usefulness so that could, uh, gain advantage of it from it thank you yes uh, yes i i agree with you um, well the the program generates a plan but it was so uh, you know uh, uh, i don't know i in, in order to make it uh, work also in terms of functions it's probably possible maybe not always but i wonder actually if labius woods was not right when he said we should first build our our buildings and then learn how to live in them you know uh, although in a way maybe we do that already but how is it that if you build a house without thinking of functions at all you just build a building and then you try to uh, make some use of that building because for example there are structures uh, that were built for a certain function and uh, then the, there was a political change uh, or uh, uh, some event happened and then the, 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 the function was totally changed. Uh, there is one like that in, in my hometown. Uh, building was, uh, uh, the structure was uh, erected for, uh, for a, a city hall and then the revolution came and then uh, the government changed 
and it became a hotel. So it is possible actually to, to build almost without thinking of functions and then accommodate some functions. Uh, in other words, make the structure work for the purpose you want to use it for. I think yes, it's, it's a dangerous sometimes. thing to see how uh, you can uh, uh, put the functions in the resulted uh, space. That would be interesting to see. Yeah, you know how I think it is? It's like I, 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 I have this metaphor of a forest, a virgin forest, that you enter into a virgin forest and you make room for yourself in that forest. And uh, uh, so it's the same here. You have a, you know, uh, some, some kind of uh, architectonic crystallization and you enter it and you make room for it. Just like, like you would make room for yourself uh, or a path and so on in a forest. You, you, you put a door here, so you break the wall for a door. You create a window here. So you, are, you begin to inhabit a structure that was built independent of your intentions. I think it's possible. Uh, of course, uh, uh, um, you know, certain people would, uh, would claim otherwise, but I think it is possible. Uh, and I feel, uh, I feel you should uh, try and work out in detail one of these houses of love that you've done, those <laughs> intersecting planes and all, uh, and then try and find a client who would build it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm not good at this at all, you know. I I, I remain at uh, you know at this uh, well, uh, you could say it's unsatisfying level. But uh, you know, I I do believe that uh, 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 you know uh, a drawing or a, a plan or a, a project uh, could 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 function at least as a uh, as a uh, machine for thinking or a machine for feeling and not a machine for living per se. And maybe you would say, well, it's not sufficient. And, they, and it's not, I, I am aware of it. But, uh, you know, uh, what can you do? Uh, you know, um, I come back to Peter Eisenman who said that actually a drawing in a certain way is more architecture than a built building. And I don't actually agree with him. I think that I think that the ultimate test for architecture is a built building where the building shows its complexity in, in dialogue with life, serving functions in dialogue with the elements, with the sun, with the winds and so on. Uh, uh, but from another point of view, for the mind, in terms of its purity, in terms of its plasticity, in terms of even its uh, philosophical meaning, Plus, uh, when you think about uh, the climate change, the, the, the excessive uh, amount of buildings that, that cover this earth, do we really need more buildings? I mean, really, is it not true that the human being uh, uh, went a little bit too far? So maybe, okay, you say it's unsatisfying. If you are an architect, you are supposed to build. But there are so many architects in the world and everyone wants to build, and everyone has the, 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 the will and the drive and the, even the vanity to build. But, but if all of us would build, I mean, the world is already saturated with buildings. For, maybe we should abstain for, 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 from buildings for a while. You know, maybe as someone said, the best way to build sustainably is not to build at all. Correct. But on the other hand, uh, I, I mean, I could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, attacked even because, you know, this could be like an excuse, you know, saying, well, uh, you know, I cannot build or it's too complicated to make that uh, into a buildable building. So you just try to invoke the climate change and so on. I am aware of this, but I think this pandemic also I mean, I'm not an expert and maybe it won't be so, but I think the pandemic is suggesting to us to actually build less. And I think we will build less because, you know, this social distancing, which still persists and is necessary, would not allow for uh, great uh, building sites 
uh, so easily. You know, you, you cannot, you know, you, you, you cannot build all over the world with the same uh, easy go lucky or, uh, you know, attitude. You have to, uh, you have to be more reflective. So maybe we are entering a, a time when a good part of our activity will be uh, maybe, or, or a part of our activity will, will be speculative, will be theoretical, will be, uh, uh, will be connected with some introversion, will be, uh, yeah, uh, uh, connected with reflectivity, with, with the mind, unless with a building site and all the rest that, because again, you know, we are consuming immense amounts of resources for what? Just, just to have our vanity triumph. I love architecture. And of course, I would love to have 40 houses of love all built, but, but wouldn't be, be just vanity? Wouldn't it be, uh, I mean, do we really need that? Maybe we should be less, less and less, and maybe then something will happen. You know, maybe we'll become more uh, uh, reflective and uh, more, uh, uh, with more discernment and will we'll build only what truly matters. And uh, in this way will affect less the earth, the nature, the climate and so on. Uh, I, 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 I'm yeah, tempted actually, to think so. Uh, what I meant was that uh, the uh, the concepts are really good, those intersecting planes and all. And uh, if in some way, maybe not build it, but we can uh, develop it into a building. Uh, some of those planes, those intersecting planes. I didn't see all the drawings very in detail, but uh, yeah, some of that. Then maybe in future, someone can get an idea of how that building can be made or I don't know. I mean a little more of design development, I guess. I understand and you know that there, there are many drawings for each one of them. I just show, show two or three images. One of them actually I, I, I developed into a model. A student uh, built a model and built it very well. I, I called it the house for Albrecht Mürer. Too bad well, Florian left because uh, you know he uh, <laughs> he appreciates <laughs> things about the uh, German the German culture. Uh, and I, I have some pictures of that model. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, uh, there is something else. When you try to develop it, you discover that certain things don't work, or uh, you'll you'll be forced to modify and so on. Yes, of course. That's why I call them pre-architectures. They are not yet architectures. I'm aware of it. I, I just wanted to show that it's possible. Pardon. Uh, we would like to see the model, uh, maybe if you have pictures of it next time. Okay, I, I, I do. I do have pictures Great. of it. But it was a, a different, uh, uh, it was done with Archicad 7, but a different uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, so-called architecture. But yes, yes. Well, but they, you know, the, the, the program generates unending views. So, you know, not only that they are buildable, but they are measurably so because, you know, the, the program generates measurements and everything. So they are buildable of this, I am sure. It's just that certain things maybe will be problematic when you, when you see the model, uh, you know, you, you would begin to wonder about certain, certain things. Uh, I, I know this. Anyway, but what did you think of the Museum of Knowledge? So called that, the museum. Was, that was wonderful and that was very well developed. I mean, the cave and all, I could see it in the section that it was nicely uh, worked on. Uh, even that, uh, that kind of structure, the, uh, the sheet that was flying in the sky, that was nice. Uh, well, I, I had the, <laughs> I had Shakira on my side, the Egyptian architect. So you know, it it, it mattered. For the other things, I did everything myself. Right. No, but it was it was a great thing. I mean, to see all your work. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call them works really. I would call them rather plays in a way, you know, because I was to an extent so-called irresponsible. <laughs> 
although for the Museum of Knowledge and even for the museum in Guggenheim, the Guggenheim Museum, I, 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 and I could send them to you. I have, uh, you know, you know, uh, text, you know, you know, explanations of why I, I did so. And uh, so, you know, uh, they were more uh, elaborate and more, uh, you know, developed in terms of you know, thinking. But the others were, you know, I was playing the violin in a way. I was just, and I can do that. I can show you with Archicad. And it's really nice. You can do very interesting things. And I didn't show you the most interesting ones because I did this very quickly to just show you a few things. But uh, I, I have really many, too many, in fact. Anyway, yes. it is said that there are two, two types of, uh, you know, so-called artists or people who create. Those who create vertically and those who create horizontally or, or uh, two kinds of scholars. One who <clears throat> investigates vertically, in other words, uh, analyzes in detail uh, very deeply something, and then there are others who extend themselves a lot horizontally. I belong to the second uh, category. You know, I, I do countless, uh, you know, alternatives and so on. Maybe I should just develop one, you know, and make it, you know, arrive with it as far as possible, I guess. Sure. But, uh, you know, anyway, I, I, I hope one day you'll also, all of you, show some works, you know, and I, I think it's important to, to, to discuss. And, you know, it doesn't matter how they are, you know. I, you don't think I'm new, I, I am exposing myself to, with my vulnerabilities. I do, but I do believe in an honest, open dialogue. And I think we all have strengths and we all have uh, things that are less, you know, problematic or developed. And we can learn from each other. You know, what Andre told me is uh, I, I agree with and uh, uh, I will consider what he said. Also, uh, what you said. Uh, Varsal, uh, we can learn from each other. I'm, I, I'm sure of it. Definitely. Yes. So, you know, here nobody judges us, you know, whether or no, uh, it's just between us. In a way, we are friends. So, you know, why, why not uh, have this chance to, 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 to share, um, you know, certain works? And I think it would be nice. Sure. David, what do you say? Because you do have a good critical mind. Uh, well, that part, I, I don't know. But I was, I, about, I, I was about to say one thing that um, for sure you are familiar with that. Uh, the Kobe's uh, architecture from um, the beginning of the 20th century in the Czech Republic, and also the uh, expressionist architecture that was um, like a trend uh, at the time, uh, more or less the time of the Bauhaus and a little bit before, and until the beginning of the Second World War. And then, um, in, in a way, the, the angles of, of those projects always reminds me uh, about that, that architecture. Of course, uh, one big problem on, on those pieces of architecture, sometimes it's the use of the spaces, because in a, in a world that is designed to make a profit out of the buildings and uh, all the architecture pieces, it, sometimes it's difficult to instigate architecture that only looks at it as a um, competitive uh, way or a, like a, a monument, which it's fine and exists, but uh, it's very difficult to to make the world understand that sometimes it's uh, it's necessary something something like that instead of some space that you can habit and inhabit and, and dual in. Well, that, that, that said, it's just uh, say that uh, kind of remind me some experimentation the, um, as part of my my routine at university in, in the, the first and the second year, where we are instigated to explore ideas of uh, utopic architecture on a part of the semester and then try to make that architecture actually work. So the principles that you are free to explore on a more free range architecture 
and without computer, only by modeling and uh, drawing. After you, you need to to try to find a way of execute at least a, a piece or a part of it in a more rational and functional way uh, that will fit uh, uh, some kind of program. But oh. what, what what did you think? Uh, sorry for uh, becoming uh, you know. No, no, no. This, what, this what did you think of, of the that sketch for the Guggenheim Museum? The iceberg. Well, it's uh, oh, what, what can I say? I although I I there, there was a once upon a time I was exploring uh, shapes like that and, and so on. I kind of. Uh, went apart from the those uh, kind of explorations i think that there are there is always a place for for them and definitely a kind of a museum or something like that will be definitely one or, of the chances that one has to to explore that and uh, for, for example uh, i i can remember about one um, architectural exploration that actually is still a, a small museum slash um, aquarium in um, in denmark where you you have basically a circle in the the middle of the sea, but if uh, some appliances are working, you can only see a a cloud um, floating on on the sea. And in a way, it's I know that is not a, what was the that project about, but um, in a way, it's like you cannot see anything besides a idea, a concept on the building and then when you approach the the building through a bridge you can actually enter uh, a space uh, and so on but before that you just see an idea of it and it was uh, i guess it was not easy to materialize that idea but they they managed to to do it so that side uh, what i want i want i want to 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 say with these comments is as far fetch as the idea is, if it is um, possible to build in a way that you have a will to build it, uh, I, I think it's always possible to, to achieve it. No, but uh, what, what do you think about uh, architectural scribbles? Meaning, uh, you know, because if you remember in that, uh, that sketch I used, so the intersection between uh, the, the various uh, roofs because I worked with roofs, is done totally in an aleatory manner. It is nothing is planned and nothing is uh, willed. It, it, it is. Uh, uh, I don't know if you if you recall uh, that. No, no, I, 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 I'm. Uh, I think I'm picturing. Yeah, Ooh. those kind of exercises, if you allow me to to call it uh, that. Um, I I think they are very very good exercises to free your mind. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, buildability, but I, I don't think that that is uh, the point on these kind of exercises. I, I think that. Uh, uh, what do you mean they are not uh, buildable? No, I'm not saying that they are not build uh, uh, buildable. I, I I just say that the, the kind of uh, drawings, these kind of drawings and projects, at least my view, it's. It's a way of free uh, one's mind. It's to to make room to to make uh, make the cr uh, creativity w within uh, within us to to come outside. So, how can I explain this? Um, just give me a moment to try to find the words in English. Please. Anyone else has something to say about this? But as I, as I said a few times, and maybe I, I could become tiring, when I asked Paul Fricks, what do you recommend architects and uh, students in Argy? He said, don't think. And that's exactly what I did when I, and I did it some years ago. I didn't think, I was just, uh, absent-mindedly uh, you know playing with that site and and i arrived at that thing without planning it i didn't plan it i didn't search for it and i didn't think 
or I didn't think in an explicit way because maybe some kind of, you know, uh, discrete form of thinking and maybe thinking not just with the brain, but maybe also with my hand, with my heart, with my stomach, with my whole being, with my, I don't know, my, my id, if I am to use a Freudian uh, little word. So, because when we, we, when apparently we do not think, I think we actually, we do think, but in a different way. And, uh, and uh, uh, that kind of thinking is not encouraged by rationalism. You know, in rationalism, we want to arrive from A to B and from B to C in a so-called logical and progressive way. No, it's also possible to, uh, uh, you know, like a painter says, well, I did this painting, but when I started this painting, I didn't know where I will arrive. And uh, um, even Frank Gehry, uh, there is a, a kind of an interview with him. He's giving some lessons now on the web. Maybe you know of them. And he begins by saying, I didn't know where I was arriving at. That's exactly how I did it too. Those scribbles were done, you know, without an intentionality. Of course, I was aware of the limits of the, of the site, but I didn't uh, have this, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, explicit uh, relationship between A and B and C, and I, it was not logical. Uh, and in that sense, I didn't involve, uh, you know, the, the so-called orthodox form of thinking. And I, I think it can be done architecturally in this way. And uh, but, uh, no. that, uh, uh, maybe I didn't explain uh, correctly, but that is, um, it's always possible to build something. Normally, uh, back home, we have a saying that uh, if you have money, you can do it. Like. Normally, if you are willing to pay and if you are uh, or you find someone that will pay for it, you can build it. Doesn't matter how long it will take. Uh, how we have a it's OK. It's not exactly as uh, charming or as exploratory like the um, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. But we had a church in Portugal that took literally 500 years to be built. It, 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 they started on the Renaissance period and they finished in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and this is our national pan, uh, pantheon. And there's nothing uh, spectacular. The only thing that is uh, impressive is the, the roof, precisely the roof, actually, that uh, has a huge um, dome that was very difficult to execute. So they had the idea and they wanted to do it, but they didn't have either the resources or didn't have the expertise at the time. But with, with the evolution of um, engineering and architecture and so on, they, may, they made it possible. And of course, another reason that was built, it was not exactly a private uh, building. It was an institutional building. So the state, uh, if you is not bankrupt, has all this money to, to do it uh, portion, little by little. Um, but that, that said, I, I, no, I, I think that it's always good to, to do scribbles, to do things without, th uh, without thinking so, sometimes, uh, like I said, to free our, our mind. It's like um, a Dada interpretation of architecture. You do like, like you are doing an um, automatic writing from the Dada movement. You just start scribbling, you sc start drawing, you start sketching, or you start modeling something, and then you see the result, and then you well, try. That's exactly why I, I chose to show you these things because the, the Arakawa also uh, works and, and took part in the Dada movement. So there is something Dada about his work. And you are right about this, that uh, the automatic writing was one of the techniques uh, used uh, by the Dadaists. Uh, and not only by the Dadaists, but yes, the Dadaists used it. So, you know, what about, uh, I mean, yes, it's possible uh, to, to do architecture in various ways. And I'm afraid the schools of architecture in general uh, limit uh, excessively the, 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 the number of possibilities. And I, I, I'm not sure that limiting is so good. Uh, anyway.
I, I do believe, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll plan some kind of uh, event or meeting to talk about uh, the Dada movement and, and a possible relationship. Also, surrealism, you know, and, and uh, by the way of surrealism, maybe when we will pay uh, homage or happy birthday to Ricardo Bofil, we can, uh, we can talk about uh, surrealism and architecture. Because architecture was very impoverished, I think, by an excess of uh, rationalism and functionalism. And I think we, we, we are paying the price for that. You know, I mean, even Herzberger, let's face it, he's, he, was, he is a rationalist. Yes, he allowed the people to accommodate, to express, to hang little, you know, ornaments or flowers. But in essence, he gave them a almost brutally rationally structure or framework. I mean, you know, yes, uh, people brought their furniture and added the things on the windows. But essentially, the building was not so kind, uh, you know, uh, so... I think uh, Alexandra was um, maybe a little bit too kind with her, uh, Herzberger. Her, Herzberger is and was a good architect, no doubt, but, but of the rationalist kind. And, uh, you know, he always worked with the grid and, uh, you know, the structure had the upper hand. That's what I'm trying to say. I think if we can work simultaneously with a sense of willfulness. So to have will, but to also have grace. In other words, to have the willfulness of structure and the gracefulness of, of ornament or the capriciousness even of the ornament. Because I think the ornament has to do more with capriciousness. And by ornament, I mean something very, you know, in a very, you know, generic sense. You know, I actually think some buildings by Zaha Hadid are ornaments in three dimensions. And other buildings, other architects as well. Um, so, anyway. Okay, you, you know, we can talk uh, the other day about other issues. And if you want to suggest uh, something for a discussion, even spontaneously, we can do it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or any time, you know. Um, I think this, these discussions are fruitful. What do you think, Azar? <laughs> Maybe Azar left is just uh, the name and the, you know, the, graphic symbol of the of the microphone hello do you still hear me should we say goodbye hello. uh i would have to go okay uh, okay so uh, i imagine the others... pardon it was interesting okay thank you the yeah, one part. Part I, I, had, I had some insights first from that burger but part but the other ones was also was also nice you, you wanted to say something about Herzberger? No, no, I, I was just saying that I had some insights uh, on the Herzberger presentation first. Uh, and then, but um, both of the presentations were, all of the presentations were, were interesting. Herzberger and the other, the other ones that follow. Okay, thank you. Alexandra left, but I think you can tell her. <laughs> yeah, she, she can listen to what I'm saying. Pardon? She, she's hearing me. Oh, okay. Very good. Okay, no Dave. So then, uh, should we say goodbye to each other? There is one person here I do not know. No, that is uh, A. Fleming. Tomorrow. Maybe A. Fleming will, will tell us. And also Diana, Diana Apetre. I do not know. Maybe you can introduce yourself just to, you know. Hello? Okay, David, see you. So, Diana Apetre and A. Fleming, I would like to know who you are. 
if you can introduce yourself in a, in, with a, you know, two words or three words. But you don't have to, it's not an obligation. It was just my curiosity. <laughs> but there is no reply, so. Okay, then I guess it's meant for us to say goodbye to each other tonight. Thank you for the presentations. Thank you, Andre. You are always kind. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Good night. And you are kind too. Okay, thank, thank you, Varsal. Bye. Bye. Uh, please send me the, uh, the announcement for tomorrow. But tomorrow, I don't know. Uh, I have to look on the... Um... Ah, okay. Uh, the next one, then, if it's not tomorrow. <laughs> Andre, you, I believe me, I, I am probably getting slowly tired because uh, I, I, I know I, today I was not very um, efficient in my work. And uh, uh, we'll see. I, I'm not sure about tomorrow. I think Philip okay. Johnson is following. <laughs> but I'm not sure if he's tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. I'll check. Okay. Uh, Philip Johnson, you know, I, I, he's, he's not my preferred architect, but he's not uh, without an interest. And uh, I think he was uh, a little more complex than people thought. Yes, he was a chameleonic uh, presence in architecture, uh, but uh, I think he's worth uh, talking about. So uh, I think his turn will be uh, Philip Johnson, yes. Sounds interesting. I, I'll send you, yes, uh, tonight, uh, the info. So it seems uh, Instagram is becoming, uh, I mean, more people, thanks to Florian. <laughs> you know, because I receive, uh, you know, signs that there is some kind of uh, activity on Instagram. Yes, yes. And uh, Florian helped because he uh, shared uh, this event to many people. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think soon. And you know, the luck is that Indonesia is a big country. I mean, it has 220,000 or something people. I mean, you know, if Indonesia is on our side, on Instagram or Facebook, <laughs> all for the better. <laughs> I mean, even yes, but he's followed uh, five percent of Indonesia will be our friends. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, okay. We'll see each other soon. I, if not tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Okay. See you soon. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andre. Bye. And now maybe Welcome. Diana will tell us. Diana, are you here? Diana, Dad, by the way of Dad, who are you, Diana? I asked to unmute. <laughs> she probably left. <laughs> Maybe she is too shy to answer. Yeah, or some people just leave this open and they leave, you know. <laughs> No, because the name is not known. I, I don't know of any student with this name, but I don't know uh, so many students. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a little bit difficult, you know. Uh, Diana, do you hear me? <laughs> Diana, do you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's clear. She, she, she's not hearing or she's not there. I think she's not there. Anyway. Okay, Andre, I guess I have to end uh, this uh, thing because uh,